You want to drive faster? Listen in as Kinch Rendell, an SCCA National Trophy winner and multi-time pro solo champion himself, interviews the best autocrossers in the land. He talks fast and drives even faster. And now here's your host, Kinch Rendell. John Venomous is our guest for this show. It's interesting how he had talked before the show about, oh, I've made all the SP mistakes. And even though I've not done much in SP, wowzer, I think it's easy. So listen up and see what you can glean from this. He also has a nice and different way of phrasing thoughts. Even about, he doesn't like the thought of just looking ahead. And you'll hear us discuss that and why he takes issue with that and the challenges you might have if you just look ahead on course. So much like Teddy in the previous interview, he has a different way of looking at things. And I think for some of us, we'll find that when we listen to these different people, something will kind of hit and we're like, oh, that's what that, that's how I can relate to that. Or that's how I can think of that. Or that's how I can walk the course or attack part of a course. So I hope you enjoy it. I know I did. John, welcome to the show. Thanks, Kench. Thank you for the time. So you just no, so you said it's a little cold out there. Actually, here you're coming out to Colorado pretty soon. It's like 50 degrees. We're gonna cool down for you. But let's get back to when did you start autocrossing? Um, when did I start autocrossing? Well, I actually did one autocross right out of high school. So this would have been 1996 or 1997 Milwaukee region. I had a mid late 80s RX7 Turbo that had. You know, I had modified it for the street to have fun and um, uh, promptly destroyed the engine like everyone who has a Turbo RX-7 does when they first get it. And I found out about the – Mazda has this Mazda Comp, you know, the competition parts program, and they give you massive, massive discounts on parts if you race, and they consider autocross racing. So I guess I did two because you had to do two to get the, the discounted parts. And I was like, well, I'll go out and try this. I had seen people doing it. And uh, it was one of those things that was – it was instantly – I was like, this is – I want to do this forever. This is amazing. I love this. That That's neat. So right out of high school, the main reason was, oh, that seems kind of cool, but I can save some money with this. Yeah, it was the only way that I could keep that car running. You know, you're, I was in high school. I worked like for the parks department cutting grass and making, you know, 780 an hour. And, um, you know, I couldn't afford to get – parts at the dealership. I mean, the, the, the Mazda comp thing was, you know, sometimes a 50% discount on parts, sometimes more, sometimes a little bit less. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I think I, I think I rebuilt the entire engine in that car, um, for, for maybe 1200 or 1300 bucks or something like that. It was, uh, and and then, you know, that, that kind of got me down the, down the path of, you know, wanting to turn wrenches on cars more and, uh, you know, wanting to kind of learn what I was doing instead of just hacking my way through stuff. Was that a Turbo 2 by chance? I seem to remember I was in high school, and I got out in 92, but my friend got the RX-7 Turbo 2, and oh my God, goodness, did I ever want one of those. Yeah, that was that was the one. It was an 80, 87 black gray interior, five-speed, awesome, awesome. I mean, it was a ter- – like, no, let me let me correct myself. It was a <laughs> terrible car. That was an awful car, but it was it was a blast when it ran. So did you have any clue how to turn wrenches? Did somebody mentor you, help you to rebuild a rotary engine? Uh, so this is a weird thing. I'm the only person in my family, I think, who was really into cars. My dad was not into cars. Um, we didn't have you know, grandparents, uncles, nothing like that. Nobody, was really, nobody really cared at all about cars. I was the only one that was sort of, sort of born with it. And I had, a, I had one friend that was – really into cars, but he was into like sixties American muscle. And, um, so, you know, he taught me how to do brakes and, you know, spark plugs and plug wires and, you know, pretty simple oil changes, like simple stuff like that. Um, but I don't know when you're, when you're just out of high school and, and you think you're invincible, you're, uh, you think you can do anything. Right. So I, I, was like, oh, yeah, I blew my engine. I can, why not? Don't I go ahead and rebuild it. So that seemed like a logical progression. And did it last after you rebuilt it? Yeah, actually, it was it, the engine was great until I sold the car, maybe um, maybe four years later or something like that. In fact, I, I I got an email from the guy who bought it from me about two years ago, um, and he still had it, and he had he had done a bunch of other stuff to it, but he had he had never actually 
really driven it since he bought it from me. He just started tearing into it, modifying it, and it got kind of carried away, and then life happened, and it's been par- it was parked in his garage for all those years. Oh, wow. So you don't even know he could have driven it for another five years and never had a problem one. I've been right. so – I've taken some engines apart, but I've been so scared to put them back together, especially because I'm thinking autocross. I don't want to end up across the country and have them break. It's a lack of confidence, but I'm glad you shared that, hey, even out of high school, you put it back together and it ran. That's a good sign. That and may show how meticulous you are. Well, uh, let me. I'll just. I mean, I guess you know. You said being halfway across the country and, and having your car break. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm like a professional at that. That that's hap- that's happened to me more times than I than I care to admit. So, I think I'm kind of famous for that. Actually, if I'm famous for anything, it's famous for going to nationals and having my car explode. Oh yeah, yeah, it, and that's where the SP that we'll probably get into at some point is is somewhat so scary to me because. Obviously, you want more and more power, and therefore, at least in my mind, that's why things eventually start shredding. So after you first did some high school, did you take time off? What was next after that RX-7, a little bit of racing? So I went to, so I went to college in 96, and, um, and I left the RX-7 at home I, for the first couple of years, and I, I dragged it out there and, and drove it there for a couple of years, but I never, I never could afford to do um, – any, any racing while I was out there. In fact, I really couldn't even afford to put gas in the car for the most part. I just, you know, the, the prototypical poor college student. So it kind of sat and I kind of forgot about the autocross thing. And, um, I ended up selling the the RX seven, I think in 2000 or or 2001. So I was kind of wrapping up my, my college career. And I bought, um, I bought something else and decided, ah, you know, I got a stipend or whatever for doing graduate school work. And I was like, ah, I can spend, you know, 20 bucks for a, a weekend, which I think was what they charged at Northeast Ohio region. And I, and I took my, my then daily driver out and started and started racing that just, just locally. Um, and so, yeah, it was probably a four year, maybe four or five year span between my first autocross and my, or my first two autocrosses and my, and my next autocross. Wow. So tell us, what did you study in college? Electrical engineering. Does that help uh, you at all with this racing habit? Uh, in, in as much as I got a job that allows me to have enough money to, to, do, to do what I want to some degree. Um, but I think the engineering thing in general certainly helps. I mean, it, it teaches you how to, I think, to some degree be methodical and learn things. Um, I, you know, I, I think engineering school more than anything sort of um, teaches you how to solve problems and how to figure things out and how to learn. I think you have to have a little bit of that inherently. You know, not everyone – can be an engineer just like not everyone can be a doctor and not everyone can be whatever. But, um, yeah, I think it, I think it helped. I, I'm wishing the two years of engineering I took at Texas A&M would have helped. I had, they've been talking about cars or something maybe instead of whatever in physics, like hanging a shark off something like what's the weight of this, this, and this. I, that's where I had two years and I called myself from it after uh, actually differential equations, not studying that called me from electrical engineering headed down that same path. I'm thinking, man, could I wish I could relate to some of that. I'm glad what you said, though. Maybe the method of thinking is actually something people can take and apply to racing or to other disciplines. I think so, yeah. I mean, it, I think it just teaches you how to, it teaches you how to learn. Um, and uh, I think the, the interesting thing that you said was that you, you, know, you couldn't get through kind of like the differential equations and the, and the kind of obscure parts of engineering. What I found was undergraduate engineering is very obscure and, and not it doesn't seem like it has any application. And then when you start doing graduate work, that's when you start doing all of the practical things. Like in my, that was my experience, at least getting into a lab and, and building things and measuring things that you've built. And um, so that was what kind of reinvigorated my interest in engineering was actually going to grad school and getting a grad degree. Yeah, that'd be neat. I hope they're changing that now in education in general, that it's more, I guess, I'm going to use the word applied. You're applying it to something so that you can maybe have relevance to remember it. That that would make so much more sense if it was a class where you're you're rebuilding a car and, or you're redoing the suspension, you're applying the the engineering and physics to that. That, that. that I'd be like, oh, I don't mind sitting here and learning and actually building something that I can apply to autocross. Maybe we can come with a whole outline just for autocrossers and engineering we'll have our own little mini series here (laughs) no they for sure no that's a good point i mean they for sure are doing that actually even more in in high school um and college before before college now i mean i've got two um 
young uh, cousins who are in high school and they're, you know, they've got these robotics classes and um, electronics classes where they're actually building stuff. And I think that's, I think that's super cool. I wish I had had more of that in high school as opposed to just, you know, theory and, and math and physics and stuff. Exactly. So what car was that that you hopped back into it at? What, what car were you driving at that point? So, <laughs> so after I sold the RX-7, I bought, um, actually bought at a, um, at an auction, I bought a Ford Taurus show. Oh, I like it. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, yeah. So I went from one terrible car to another really, frankly, terrible car, even more terrible car. Um, but I wanted something with four doors and it needed to be at least somewhat interesting and have a stick. So I, I bought this 95 show and, um, my friends made fun of me relentlessly for that car. And then the people at the autocrosses made fun of me relentlessly for that, for that car. But honestly, I'll, I'll be honest with you. That was the car that actually made me want to, gave me the motivation to actually try and become good at autocross. Cause frankly, I was, I was terrible. And I mean, yeah, I was probably terrible until I would say maybe four or five years ago. I, I remember those cars vividly, because they were quite quick in a straight line from what I remember. Do they have something like a Mitsubishi engine or something in it? So it's a Ford engine, but it's got a Yamaha designed ah, there you go. Cil- cylinder heads. And then it had this funky two stage intake manifold. So it had decent torque. It was only a three liter, but it had decent torque in it. And it actually had pretty good top end power and it sounded awesome. And it was pretty fast in a straight line for, for something that was, you know, 3,400 pounds in a, in a family sedan, but it didn't, it didn't turn or stop with a damn. And you're autocrossing it. Well, it might be kind of important to turn and stop. But something about that, you, you either got good enough or it gave you enough thrill. What 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 really tied you into that, into autocross with that car? I think what it was was that I, you know, it had, I had, I'd put springs and shocks on it because when I bought the car, it actually had um, a broken rear spring, which I think was fairly common on those Tauruses. And I, uh, I think I put a set of eye box on it or something, you know, they weren't stiff, but it wasn't, it was no longer stock. So, um, I heard about this, this street touring thing. And at the time ST, what they called STS was actually, I think it was like three liters and under or, or something to that degree, but, um, you know, s- sedans and, and coupes and, and things like that, but not sports cars, right? It was, you know, it's, it's, I guess it would kind of be the equivalent of STF now, but it was, you know, or, or, or STS now, um, but you know, it went from like S- STS to ST to STC, and now back to STS. But um, yeah, so I ran the car in STS, and there was a pretty decent group of people in the Northeast Ohio region running STS. I mean, we had these fifteen or twenty car fields, um, and of course, I'm the only one with a, a Ford Taurus show, right? People had more reasonable things like, you know, Super Two Point Five RSs and Neons and and all the stuff that was kind of, you know, cheap in the in the early two thousands, and um, you know, I didn't. I don't think I ever won anything, even locally, in that car. But I was fast enough that people started, um, you know, saying, "Oh, the car must, you know, the car must not be that bad." And they'd ride with me. And I remember there was this one. I can't remember his name, but he ran a an MR2 Turbo, and he ran with me. And um, he got out of one run, and he went. You. He, he said, "This is actually what got me in. He made me want to do more autocrossing." He was a pretty fast driver, and he said. You are way faster than your car. If you ever get into anything remotely decent, I bet you would be really good at this. And I sat back and kind of thought about it, and I went, I never really, th- like, I never really thought that it would be something that I would be good at. And so, uh, you know, I, I don't know that. I think that kind of lit a fire under me, to be honest. That's nice. So basically, you were given a compliment, which gave you the hope and the new thought of, wow, may- maybe it's the car holding me back, not me. And I bet, like me, I know I can look at certain people and go, wow, you know all the cars you're driving or the car you always drive not being prepped is what's really kind of holding you back. You have no clue if you can do this. And that really helped you when somebody gave you a compliment. Oh, yeah, yeah, it did. It did, for sure. That's something for all of us to think about. If you see somebody in a car that just seems like they could be good at this, let them know, hey, if your car's not prepped or if it's not the right car, you're just never going to overcome the stiffest competition because most likely that is the correct car with a good driver in it. Oh yeah. And I, you know, I think that, I think that comment really stuck with me because I've, you know, I've taught a bunch of local schools. I've taught an Evo school and, and, um, you get people that come out and I'm sure you've experienced this from, from teaching or riding along with people, but 
you can tell almost immediately whether someone has what it takes to be good at it and they just need a little bit of work or whether to be honest they're just never going to get they're never going to be good right i mean you you know to some degree on that first run well i i'm the ever optimist so i'm holding out hope that people can get better but i i guess what you're kind of what what i think you're seeing and yes we all can see it if somebody's naturally adept at doing this it it just they're clicking right off the bat whether it's a good car or not cuz i yeah i can think of people i forget what it was some old ford contour or something this guy was amazing in that car. And it's like, oh my goodness, if you can do it in that car. So there are those people, they're, they're, they're aliens just waiting to land in the right car to show off. Oh, yeah, I definitely. And then, like when the Whiteners were talking, and they said we were bad for a long time, they got a coach, and they put in the time. And that, that just surprises me how much, if you start looking around at who's racing and how much they're racing, sometimes having a coach in life and racing and business and putting in the effort seems to really pay off for some people. So I do really wonder. It almost be like a good made for autocross only watching TV show. Could you grab people? Hey, we're going to coach these five people and see how well we can do after a week or a month or something. Because I do, I, I do wonder about that. How many of us are limited by our natural ability versus having a clue by being coached by doing it, having enough seat time to get better? I, I do kind of wonder that. Which brings me to a thought I had for you. So I think you're competitive. You can say yes or no to that. Did you do any sports or competitive things outside of or before autocross? Uh, no, no, I really didn't. Um, you know, it's 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 funny because I um, I am an inherently extremely competitive person. You know, I was competitive with my big brother when I was growing up in in the stupidest things and perhaps. Um, most annoyingly, he, he just honestly didn't really care. My brother is, is probably the most laid back guy that you'll ever come across. And he just, I'm super competitive with him and I'm trying to beat him in everything. And he just could not care less. Um, but, and, you know, and he played sports and stuff and I, I really never did. I mean, I, you know, I played softball when I was a kid, but that, that was pretty much it. And to be honest, I was never, I was never really good at any sports. Um, I was kind of small and, um, it was like, you know, I wasn't going to go play football and, uh, I wasn't, I wasn't good at baseball and I just sort of never found anything that I was really interested in except for recreational things like, like skiing. Um, and it wasn't until I found autocross that I went, Whoa, yeah, I, I really need to do this because purely because of the competitive aspect of it. And in fact, um, I did my first two autocross and I totally forgot about this, but when I was in college, when I still had the RX seven, uh, um, a guy that um, was going to school with me said, "Hey, I have a I have a buddy that is renting out. Um, you know, he's part of the Porsche Club, and they're renting out Nelson Ledges, just like racetrack in Ohio, um, not far from where I went to school. And he said, I bet I can get us in um, because they're looking to fill. You know, they've got you know a couple. They've got some spots openings. I bet we can. I bet we can get in pretty cheap. And I was like, oh, I've never been to a racetrack. Sure, let's do it. Um, and so I did that maybe three or four times with him, and um, and it did, it did nothing for me. Um, I, I just, you know, the first couple laps on a racetrack I thought were pretty fun. And then I just kind of went, eh, because it's not, there's no, there was no competition. There was nothing to make me want to go faster and get better other than I can do this lap better than the previous lap. Right. Um, and so I went from autocross to track and then went back to autocross and I've never been to back to the track since. Interesting. And you can tell me if you've done any of the go-karting. I was doing indoor go-karting when Dylan Smith worked with me. And we would go and do that. And what was so crazy was I there was competition in that they had the computer system that would show you who was top time of the week or where you ranked in there. And that was the big driver for going back. And also every lap you could see the TV screen to see if you were plus or minus the last lap. So it's so funny that it's mainly against yourself. I think autocross, I'm competing with myself, really. Can I drive the best I can drive, and how does that stack up? We'll find out at the end of the day. But it was all about that, and as soon as they dropped that online, showing me where I was ranking, I quit going. So, so it's so interesting that unless you're on the track and you can have that real-time feedback probably with other people, the draw just isn't there. I, I understand that totally. Yeah, no, 100%, 100% agree. That's exactly it. And, and yeah, I've had the, I had the exact same experience at Karting, um, and, and I and I love karting as long as you know it's an enduro and we're racing. Um, if it's just 
I'm out there laughing by myself. I have no interest, just no interest. Yeah. So, so interesting. That's, and it's neat to hear somebody else. I've done a little bit of track and mostly I want to go back to the track in hopes that it'll help me with sweepers in autocross. So that's the kind of weird little, I like, I've got all these specifics sitting there. I'm supposed to build a track car out of just for that hope that it's going to help me there. Whereas I know a lot of the guys here, they do both. They go back and forth and back and forth. They, whereas I've just not had as much of a draw to that. So that's, that's interesting. You, you made some track events, kind of forgot about them and it just really didn't do much for you. No, and, but and, you know, when I listened to David and Kim talk, um, and Andy to some degree, you know, it made me think, Oh, maybe I really should get back to the track because I do think that there are skills that you can learn at the track, you know, from, from some of it being, being accustomed to the car and how it behaves when you're at higher speeds, you know, in national events and you're, and you're, you know, at speeds that you maybe won't see at a local event. And like you said, with, with sweepers in particular, just steady state stuff is certainly easier on the track because you have so much time to think about what you're doing and your inputs as opposed to autocross where it's so rapid fire. Um, so I think about going back, but, um, I just have so much going else, you know, so much, so much else going on in my life that I, I just haven't, you know, I haven't really found the time to do it. I'll give a shout out to the rallycross people. I meant to over a decade ago when I had a Mitsubishi Evo. I'm going to go rallycrossing, and I just have not made an event yet. I, mean, I also wonder, will that extra slippage help me learn more car control or more feel or something? The same thing. It's like if I can figure out enough time, I would definitely do that as well, just in hopes, once again, that it makes me a better overall driver. And when you said track, I'm thinking back to an interview you haven't heard yet with Teddy Alexandrova. She pointed out how braking – if she's braking hard and late, it's on a tight turn versus a big like sweeper, like on the track. And that's where I think if I'm on bigger turns all the time, I might get my braking better because of all that track practice for our larger, higher speed sweepers. I just love the way she had said that she goes, Oh yeah. I think of if it's a short, a small little turn, obviously with nothing too fast after it. That's where I break harder and later. Whereas on the track, I guess there's less and less of those unless it's after the straight that you're really going to apply what I consider well type R type braking, shifting to first gear type stuff. What what car were you driving after the Tara show? Well, so you know, interestingly, I I've, I think my autocross career can be best summed up as John makes a series of really bad decisions, and um, the next bad decision I made from an autocross standpoint was I bought an E thirty six M three because I graduated college and I had a job and I had some money and I thought. God, I've always wanted an E36 M3. When I was in high school, I get the magazines, and there were two cars that I was absolutely obsessed with. One was the third-gen Mazda RX-7, which I guess sort of makes sense. And then the other was the E36 M3, and I, I just decided I had to have one. And I, was, and I thought to myself, eh, how bad at autocross could it be? Um, and the answer is a lot better than a four-tour show, but you know, it wasn't competitively classed. And so I really only did, you know, it was, it was classed with S 2000s. Um, this was back in the B stock days. Um, so I don't know, maybe, maybe 2002, 2003 timeframe. Um, so, so I bought one of those and I started running it locally. Um, and, uh, and there was a, a guy, uh, in our region with an S 2000 that pretty much won every event. And I think I was racing on Victor racers and he was on, he was probably on A3 SO3 Hoosiers. Um, and uh, the, the year I ran a set of Victor Racers for two years, same set, two years, every local event. And uh, the next year I got a set of A3 SO3 takeoffs from um, a guy that did road racing and used them for qualifying. And uh, I'm still in B stock and I, I had those mounted up to my, my E36 M3 and I, I beat this guy at the next two, the first two autocrosses of that season. And he, he came up to me after the second event and was like, what, what did you do to that car? And I was like, I didn't do anything to the car. And he said, well, he was, this guy was, uh, he was pretty direct. He was like, well, you were, you were slow last year. And I said, well, I don't know. I just got better tires for it. And that started this rivalry between he and I, it's like a friendly rivalry, you know, between he and I, um, for the rest of that year. And I, I ran that car for, I want to say maybe, maybe, you know, it was probably three autocross seasons, um, before, before moving on, but it was, it was fun, but it wasn't competitive. And I certainly wasn't going to do anything nationally with it. That's yeah. I remember back in those days, 
there would be like 60 or 70 S 2000s at nationals. It was insane. Oh yeah. Yeah. So what did you drive in national at nationals in V stock? What in 2006 and seven or no six and five? Well, so I, I want to think. So my first year at nationals was I think 2005 because it had to be, it had to be a five because it was the last year we were at Forbes. Um, and I ran a, uh, Mazda RX eight that was owned by, um, a local guy named, uh, Clyde Kaplan. So we ran the whole season together. I think we did like the Atlanta national tour that they had. Um, we did the, uh, there was a tour in, in Toledo and we went out to nationals together, um, and drove his car there. And I think we, yeah, we ran that car in 05 and then again at 06, the first year at Heartland Park. Um, yeah. Yeah, it looks like you were in B stock those first two nationals, then you moved to A stock. So you had that M three. At some point, you gave up on that, and then then what was next? So I still had the M three while while I was running with Clyde in the RX eight. Um, but yeah, yeah, I like I said, I had given up on that. Um, and then and then um, I started a, a series of um, kind of a good car, bad car, alternating. And the 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 next car I ran was a. 986 Boxster S in A stock, and um, I'll never forget. Um, <laughs> I it's funny I, I I'm sh- changing gears I guess a little bit, but um, when I was running the the RX the RX8, um, the last event the last local event of the year in 06, Sam Strano came out and he was running an MR2 Turbo. Believe it or not, if you can picture Sam Strano driving an MR2 Turbo um, with with Mike Snyder, and um, it was in B stock at the time, and I think he I think he bought it primarily for pros, and uh, he ran we ran the last event, and uh, I can't remember if I beat him or if he beat me by a little bit, but it I didn't learn this until years later, but it really pissed him off uh, that we were that we were so close in time, and I you know I think it was like the you know, and Sam is not, he, he's, he's really not arrogant, but he, I think he had a little bit of this, I'm Sam Strano. How are you even remotely in the same ballpark as I am? Right. Huh. And, um, that kind of, that kind of forged a, a friendship between he and I. Um, but you know, getting back to the Boxster, um, I, I went out to nationals in it in, uh, Oh seven, I guess was the first year I brought that out to, um, Heartland park. And, uh, I was, I think I was in, in paddock changing tires and Sam kind of strolled by and, uh, he, he made some kind of a snide comment and, and, uh, I asked him what he said and he said, he said, who thinks it's a good idea to pick the only car without an LSD and run it in a stock. And I just sort of looked at him and I said, yeah, I, it, I, I've not been known for making good decisions, but it seemed like a good idea at the time. Um, and it was fun. I mean, it was it was reasonably competitive. I think it could do okay on certain courses, but it was it was certainly not a match for an S two thousand. And that's something else for people to think about. It, if you really haven't looked at everything available, and limited slip is quite helpful, you may be bringing a dull knife to a sharp knife contest. Well, and that's the thing. I mean, there's Andy Hollis uh, talked about this is this is years ago, but I remember there was a if it was a spreadsheet or a you know kind of a, a matrix of of qualities that you can can use to rate cars that you're thinking about and i think he used it for purposes of classing um and uh yeah i mean it's you know obviously if you're in a class that has cars that have a limited slip diff probably you want to pick one that has limited slip diff and and wheel width and availability of camber and and back when we were running stock it was you know how much hoosier can you stuff under the stock fenders you know there's like mr2 guys that were were stuffing like you know 245s or something on on six inch rims and, and, and things like that, which isn't with, with street tires now, that's just, you know, there's not nearly the benefit to it that there was when, when everyone was running Hoosiers, but you know, there's kind of this list of qualities that you want to have when you're, when you're picking a car. And I, I more said, oh, no one's tried this. I think I'm going to go and I think I'm going to go and, and do it and see if I can make it work. And in some instances, you know, it, it did work out, you know, reasonably well on certain courses. Um, but, but most of the time, um, yeah, the, the lemming effect exists for a reason. I mean, the cars that people pick that are fast are, um, you know, people run them because they're fast. Yeah, it gives them a chance, I'd say. And and you trophied, looks like your first time in B-Stock, I guess in that RX-8 in 2006. Looks like you were seventh overall there. Yeah, yeah, that was my first Nationals trophy. 
Like, yes. And the RX-8. Someone just mentioned that an RX-8 is just like a big Miata. Think that's oh, true? Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, I mean, it's very similar to an NC Miata. It's, it's got a longer wheelbase. Um, but but the guts underneath it, you know, the, the, the double wishbone suspension up front and the kind of multi-link double wishbone in the back um, is, is pretty much identical between the two cars from what I remember. And um, I, I still think that the RX-8 is one of the sweetest handling cars I've, I've ever driven. I mean, it's up there with, um, you know, Corvette Z06s, um, Miatas, although the NC, I was not ever really, I never really bonded with that car. Um, but uh, just, you know, one, one of those cars that you can instantly get in and feel uh, like you can drive it to the, to the limit um, and uh, very comfortably. Yeah, I remember watching Jason, why am I blanking his name, not Sany, Jason from California, driving his for years. I think he won a couple of championships there in a row. I mean, Isley? Uh, Isley, I, there, thank you. Just, I mean, one. flogging that car. I mean, I've seen several people doing that. They, they look like they do stick amazingly well. Yeah, they're great cars. So from B stock, you ended up in A stock for the next Nationals. What, what yeah. was in between there? Uh, yeah, so 05, 06, RX-8, B-Stock, 07, 08, uh, the Boxster, and A-Stock. And I think I trophied once in the Boxster, too. Yep. Um, but, but like, real low. It might have been, like, 11th or something like that. Ninth, buddy. Give yourself more credit. Ninth. Yeah, well, I like the odd numbers. <laughs> no, oh, you've got the second there. See? you, you Yeah. Odd, you should start liking odd numbers that are really small. Oh god, that that second that's gonna haunt me for a long, long, long time. I, I don't keep track of them anymore at this point. I just I know that several times I've been first on day one and not overall. <laughs> well, that was the, so that was the only time I've ever been first on day one was when I when I finished second. Yeah, that that one hurt. That one. Hurt. Uh, yeah, so you're gonna end up in SP here pretty quickly, but you have a little foray in super stock. It looks like. Yes, I did. So is this yeah. where you drove a Z06? Yeah, yeah, I bought a I bought a Z06 C5 Z06. Um, it was another one of those cars that was kind of a I have to own one of these at some point. And um, part part of it was I think Strano kind of convinced me that um, you know he, he he did a little bit of the would you know would you get yourself into something competitive please? Um, and uh, so I bought a C5 Z06. I actually love that car. Um, one of the most phenomenal cars. If if you haven't driven one. Um, Go find someone at a at a local event um, that's got a, a Z06 and see if you can um, get a get a co drive in one um, because just amazingly easy car to drive if you have a little bit of discipline with your right foot um, and they just do everything well so yeah I did one season in, in one of those and uh, that was the uh, I ran that in I guess that was 09 the um, first year in Lincoln and um, that was when that was before they had realized that the plain side course where it kind of dips down toward the corn side course um, there's absolutely no drainage in that part of the lot and and it torrentially downpoured in between or kind of like halfway through the first runs of first drivers in superstock that year and so there's this picture of my my car um, the the z06 and you can't see anything except the bow wave coming over the the hood of the car. It was a it was a horrendous horrendous year. That's right, because yeah, whoever won, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name. You had to be a first driver to have a shot at winning. Katzian, yeah, yep. Katzian won that year, and and yep, you. And in fact, my brother still still reminds me of that because it's one of the few years my brother came out to nationals, ran as Elise, and he beat me. He was a he was a first driver. And he ran before the rain, and uh, yeah, he crushed me, crushed me. Ah, it's only five spots difference as I look right here, thirtieth to thirty fifth, and crush you. Well, maybe there's a yeah. gap of two seconds, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> details. Let's not let the details get in the way of a good story. I don't know what they are. I don't know what they are. So I'm saying it's just only five spots. So yeah, yeah. Keep that edit, edit that part out about the two seconds. <laughs> I may. I don't know what. I'm just guessing because you sounded like it was a lot. You said, "Oh, it was he killed you." So were you competitive in that car? Were you fast? I don't know. I mean, I you know, at times, yes. Um, but this was this was sort of before I had really gotten. I mean, I started doing national events, but it was before I had kind of figured out that the things that you have to do, I think, to become good and become competitive, even if you you know, unless you're a unless you're of alien status, like a like a height cutter. Not to say that he doesn't work, because I know he works extremely hard. 
at his, at his racing. But, you know, I think there are people that have an inherent ability that can come out and instantly be fast. And I, I was definitely not that person. So, you know, there was, it, it was going to take a lot of work to get there. And I think the Z06 definitely took me further down the path of wanting to become serious at it. And I, and that's the first year that I really started to work on it. Like I took an, I took an Evo school, um, you know, Sam and I started kind of working together a little bit in, t- in certain terms of setting up the car and, and, you know, setting up my head and my ability to drive. Cause it, you know, I think for me, it's probably 95% mental, um, when, when I'm fast versus when I'm not fast. So tell us what are those things? Is it beyond seat time Evo school? So that's getting coaching car set up. What else does it really take to, to hit that next level? Well, you know, I think it differs from person to person, but, um, you know, David and Kim both made the comment that seat time is tremendously important, you know, and I, I, the, the things that they said about going and renting, um, you know, a site and just running drills, you know, over and over again, um, and learning, you know, making massive changes in, in shocks or bars or whatever, um, to see what the effects are, um, is certainly a huge part of it. Right. But, um, for, for me, I'm very, um, I, I believe very much in people are, are programmed, right? Um, and, and if you program yourself well and you program yourself to do the right things, then you will inherently do the right things. You'll be in a habit of doing the right things when you get to an event. Um, you'll be in the right state of mind and, and, um, and, you'll, and you'll perform at your best. So seat time in and of itself is not valuable. Seat time where you're reinforcing the right behaviors and you're teaching yourself to do the right things like, uh, you know, having your, your, your eyes in the right place, um, you know, as you're looking your way around a course and, you know, working on getting on and off the brake smoothly is a, is a huge one that took me a long time to get good at. And I'm still working on, um, you know, unwinding the wheel, just things that you think are kind of basic, but you need to program yourself, I think, to make those things automatic. Because if you're on the course and you're having to actively think about those, you'll be slow. You can't be fast and do something like that. You have to be, you know, in the zone, I guess, so to speak. So, um, and, you know, to be honest with you, I practice a lot of that stuff on the street. You don't have to drive fast. At least I don't think I have to drive fast to program myself to do the right things, you know, to, um, I hate the, I hate the term looking ahead cause I, I don't think that's really what it is, but, um, you know, to, to plan where you want the car to be and, and all that. I, I totally love the way you just worded that. And then you really tied it all together when you said you practice on the street. I, th- for most of us, obviously we drive more on the street or we have the opportunity to drive more on the street than anywhere else. I'm the guy in this neighborhood. Now where I live, the homes are all on like five acres. So it's pretty spread out. I don't pay attention to the line in the middle of the road. I'm cutting distance or I'm going back and forth. And the other thing, like you're saying, when I lived in the city, I would do this even more, especially since I left foot brake, even in the automatic cars or trucks I was driving, I'd be practicing on and off the pedal smoothly. I think that that's where you can do it every single day. You can practice that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Getting on and off the pedal smoothly. Um, you know, it's, it's fairly easy to, you know, find a, find a wide entrance ramp to a freeway, you know, that has a, that has a little bit of a, a shoulder, um, and, and, and go, go up to it at a, at a reasonable pace and, and practice getting off the, you know, braking and then getting off, releasing the brakes and feeling the weight transfer. Um, that was a huge, uh, way that I think I was able to make the Boxster fast was, you know, those cars have no front grip. You know, they, they turn in instantly because there's, there's no weight, but they have no, they have no camber. They've got no wheel, no tire up front. So, um, you really have to get the rear of the car moving on corner entry with with trail braking, um, and if you and if you get it right, you get to get back on the gas, and you honestly don't even notice most of the time that it doesn't have a limited slip diff um, in sweepers um, if you if you've transferred weight well. Um, but yeah, you can practice that practice that stuff all the time. That's very interesting. We're gonna dive into that, even though maybe you weren't setting up cars at that point. But that's like keep hearing about this GT3 or any Porsche type. And the biggest thing I noticed, once again, you come into a turn and you get to about the midway point and I press the gas pedal and off I go to the outside of the turn. So can you describe to us how with the weight transfer is the rear of the car sliding around for you or what's going on in that whole entry point? Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, there, someone 
you know, I, I, I tend to get into stupid arguments with people about, um, word choice and, and I, but I, I think it, I think it is important because someone said, Oh, you just drive a boxer like pitch and catch, you know, you pitch it into the turn and then you, and then you catch it and ride the slide on the way out. And to me, I think that certainly is you can you can drive like that, and I've seen people drive GT3s and, and Boxsters and things like that and go very 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 fast. But to me, that is not that's not how I internalize what what I'm trying to do or what I think the car wants. Um, for me, it's it's pitch and catch implies that you're being abrupt with it, and I and it's not abrupt. It's you know it's stand the, stand the car on its nose, and then you know in the same way that the you know that the steering wheel is tied you know, a string is tied between the wheel and the gas pedal, right? It's the same thing on the brake. Um, so after the front end is loaded up, you start trailing off the brakes and bending the car into the turn, and you have all that weight on the front end and the back end becomes light, and there, you definitely generate a little bit of a slip angle um, at the at the rear of the car, and you can kind of feel it, especially in a mid-engine car, and I love mid-engine cars, but you can kind of feel it rotate basically right at the bottom of the driver's seat. And, um, and if you're looking in the right place and you're finding the exit of the corner, you'll know exactly when you can go back to the gas and start unwinding the wheel. And it's not something that you pick up immediately. And a lot of people don't like it. You know, I've, I had other people drive, my co-driver at the time hated the Boxster because he called it evil. You know, he, he always felt like the back wanted to, wanted to pass the front. Um, and, and I just... I like loose cars. I don't. I hate cars that understeer, so I, I just can't do anything with them. Um, and everyone says, "Oh, the Boxster understeers, it understeers, it understeers." It really doesn't, to be honest with you. In certain situations, yeah. I mean, the same thing with the Elise. You know, the Elise I think is kind of an evil handling car, but um, when you're really flogging it, and when you really kind of get a, you know, you can feel the polar moment of inertia moving. Um, it, it, they're phenomenal. Uh, it's very rewarding. I, and I, I want you to bring up all the different word choices you would use. I am convinced that people will listen to different people, and it won't make sense until they hear the correct words that they can relate to. And I don't think you heard the Tom Reynolds interview. He talked about with the GT3, you really need a half lift and a full lift. And I'm tying this in from what you were saying because I feel like I try to drive the car by getting it on, on its nose, by braking really hard. And all I kept thinking the GT3 was – how long can I keep the load on the front tires while turning? So can I brake hard and trail off easy to keep some weight there? But I was thinking abrupt, just like you're saying, a pitch and catch. I'm thinking abrupt instead of realizing from what you're saying, you can accomplish this in a smooth manner, but I'm just not aware of it and or from car setup, from car to car or something. So I'm, I'm glad that you're willing to use different words to describe that because it's still a mystery to me. The only way I've gotten somewhat okay in that car is when I actually shut it down for tight turns because it's not magical and it doesn't just do those better than everything else in the world. So I, please continue with the words that are a different choice, especially from anything I use. Sure, sure. And that's where it, it was interesting with Tom Reynolds going with the half lift and full lift, and Andy Hollis kind of backed this up that he has a lift as well as a left foot to brake with. And that I've tried a few times now trying to get my left foot off, the, and it really did seem to help in the GT3. I'm not sure if it's because it gives a little bit of transition time to move that weight around. Give me your thoughts on that, because I have not ever really considered weight transfer. So now when I'm on the street, like I want to go drive now, I don't care if it's an SUV, I want to start paying attention to that. So expand on that if you can. Well, so I, I'm going to give a... I'm going to give a shout out to Sam Strano on this because um, I think what a lot of people um, – there are very few people that are as good at this as he is, um, and that is managing the weight of the car. Um, and, and that is something that he really drilled into me when uh, very early when – I mean at the first Evo school um, when he when he rode with me. And um, you know he, he made the point that – you know, at the time I was driving the Z06, and it's a, you know, 3,000-ish pound car. And he's like, look, you know, I, I know it has big tires. It's got a big engine. It's got big brakes. Um, but it, it weighs a lot, you know, you know, comparatively. And you can't make all that mass do something instantaneously, especially not something that is a street class now or then a stock class car. It has, you know, even a Z06 has relatively soft springs. It's got relatively soft, forgiving shocks, right? You need to... And you want to manage the weight 
so that you can make the car do what it wants to do and, and don't try and force it to do something it doesn't want to do. And to be honest with you, that that's one of the reasons that I don't left foot brake. Um, and uh, maybe it's driving street prepared, I don't know, but um, you know, I'm in DSP and, and I think people don't understand DSP is really a, I think it's a momentum class. I mean, it, people think, oh, the BMWs, they've got all this torque. And then people get in my car, they drive it and they went, oh, this thing is a dog. It can't get out of its own way. You know, and it, yeah, you carry speed. And it's like Andy said, you know, it's, you, you go around the whole, you certainly have to break, but you go around a lot of the course with a full lift or most of the time just kind of partial lifts. Um, and you know, if the, if the, if the weight of the car is not in the right place, um, you know, it's going to push or it's going to get loose. Uh, and, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's something, it's something that the people that like Sam Strano is one, um, watch Mark Daddio drive anything, but in particular when he had his F stock or F street Mustang, I can't remember. Um, the rear of the car was never pointed in the same direction as the, as the front. You know what I mean? As, as he was going around the course, uh, Ian Stewart was another when, um, when he was in super stock in the GT three and then GJ Dixon is another one when he was in the GT three. Um, you could see that those guys always had the rear of the car doing the work, right? They were relying on the front end to get it pointed in the right direction, but they were, they were setting themselves up so that they could get on the gas as soon as, as, as soon as possible. That's so interesting you say that, and what I want people to relate to, even if you're not in a DSP or in a Z06, if you're in a stock car with soft suspension, I think this is equally as important because it takes time for your car to set, is what I always say, which now I'm thinking it's taking time for that weight to transfer. Is that the correct thinking? That's that's how I see it. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it, you, you can make the car as, as stiff as a board. You know, a lot of people just make these roller skate cars that, you see them going around the course and they don't roll at all. And, um, and they certainly make those, make that work. And that, but that just has never, that has never worked for me. Um, and maybe it's all the time I've spent driving with and riding with Sam, but, um, you know, I tend to, I tend to set up the car on the softer side, um, and, and make it, you know, a little bit more compliant, uh, and off the bump stops. And, you know, it's, it's, it's different philosophies, but either way you have to, you have to, you have to focus on managing the weight transfer. So you mentioned that people get in there and you think DSP is a momentum class. It's a dog. I actually drove your car and believe you me, I'm hoping you found more power because I was assuming that if you took a car from D stock or D street to DSP, they were going to be magically faster and have all this power. I could, it was a test and tune day. The tires were kind of shot the car was probably super hot from really hopping in and hopping out. Youngers had it out there. I drove it. I was blown away that it did not feel quick. It, it just, I got right out of the Integra, jumped into that, and expected something. But it was really like you're saying. It seems like to me I learned, this is almost like a CSP Miata in my mind. Once you get going, it just sticks. Oh, yeah. It's, it's just, it's a big ball of grip. Um, now, the car was... I mean, the, the, you know, we we could we could spend an entire podcast um, of the the things that were wrong with that car when I bought it that were that were when I say wrong, not what it was advertised to be or not what it was supposed to be, but um, yeah, I imagine when you drove it, it was probably um, well when I bought it, it was forty five or fifty horsepower down on where it is now, and, and this is not any credit to me as a as as a as a builder, which I you know I put in quotes, but um, more just fixing things that were just blatantly embarrassingly horribly wrong with that car when i bought it so i'm, I'm glad believe me i got in i'm like uh really okay I, you know what a type r integra can really compete in dsp because this is not fast <laughs> it just I, our quick should be the word yes they stick and that's what i've got to relate to last weekend in the volkswagen scirocco that kevin winslow built for fsp i co-drove that and it <laughs> yeah. so reminded me of an ep civic i hopped in it just stuck i was like oh my goodness i can go faster I imagine that's what it's like in your car. Whoa, I should go faster through these turns because I have more stick than most other cars. Yeah, the fun. I think the fun thing about having an SP car, and this is not unique to DSP, but having a, a really good SP car is taking someone for a ride that maybe has a street class car or, or back in the day a stock class car. And um, and and what I, what I always love is is approaching a, a slalom in a car like that with with someone in the passenger seat that's never been in one before and. Um, you know, you can kind of count the amount of times that they look for the uh, 
they try and find that brake pedal that's on the the, the other side of the car, um, and you know they, they finish a run and they're they're just white or they're giggling uh, because it just it's unfathomable how fast you can go through. I, I imagine I can't imagine what it's like in a mod car, or a, you know, or something like that. But for something that's a, you know still a door slammer that um, c- can get through a slalom as as fast as a DSP or a CSP car can uh, is is pretty insane. That that's how I felt when I got in Jeff Lundgren's Z06. I was passenger. He comes up to something. I know we're turning right, and I go to grab or push. I'm like, okay, we're about to hit all these things and go straight off the course. That thing just shut it down and hooked to the right. I'm like, wowzer. It just blew me away. And actually, I don't think I've ever ridden a DSP car, so I've not had that wow factor yet. Well, we'll have to we'll have to make that happen at uh, maybe test and tune course or something at nationals. Exactly. Give me a hook to something else faster. So you had mentioned before we started recording DSP mistakes. What what should we look out for if we're dare going to do this, or what can you teach us, good, bad, and different? How much time do you have? Hey, we've got time. It's how much time you have. <laughs> no, um, you know, it's some of it's some of it's obvious. I mean, you know, the, I guess at the at the top of the list um, for me personally is if you buy a car that is already built or purported to be built correctly um go ahead and just assume that that's not the case just go ahead and assume that you're going to have to redo most of the things that were done to that car at least at least start checking things off you know just the basic nut and bolt kind of kind of things like does the car have engine mounts um or or are they using the bottom of the hood as an as the engine mount um but you know the, the the big things for me were um you know i resisted going to the the big the, the 315 Hoosiers for, for a long time. I, until this past year, I was running on the 285 Hoosier. Um, and, uh, you know, there were other, you know, there were other people that were starting to put the 315s under the car, like the ESP cars run. And, um, I resisted it because I, you know, I didn't want to make the car wider and, and, uh, it just, it seemed like too much work. You know, I didn't, I didn't think it was going to make that big of a difference. It makes that big of a difference. You should always try and cram the most tire under the car. Um, as much wheel, as you can fit, um, really is kind of the determining factor and then, um, find the tire that's going to fit on that wheel. Um, so, you know, that's a, that was a big thing. Um, you know, making sure that, that your, you know, that your shocks are in, are in good shape, um, and that they're valved appropriately for the, for the spring race that you're going to run. Um, having a, a, a limited slip diff that is, that is set up for the, your driving style and for what the, you know, the, the power that the car makes, um, you know, whether you have a, a clutch type diff and, and making sure that it's ramped correctly and, and, um, you know, has some preload and, and not a ton of preload and that you don't have a road race diff, you know, there, are, you know, these basic things like that. And, and really for me, a street prepared car is kind of, um, as much tire as you can fit having a good diff and having good shocks. And, and you're, I think 80%, 85% of the way to a, a good street prepared car. Can you break down all this knowledge on limited slips that you just mentioned from ramping up, road racing, enlighten us? Well, so you know, I think everyone has different philosophies on this. I know some of the, the CSP Miata guys run run effectively a Torsen diff in those cars. Um, but, you know, in the, in the BMW world, um, you know, you've seen BMWs go around an autocross course, right? They very rarely are all four tires on the ground at the same time. And, and so inherently a, a Torsen just doesn't really work that well. I know Mike Shields, I think won two or three championships in a row in a, in a DSP car that had a Torsen. Um, Mike is, Mike is one of the smoothest drivers that I've ever seen. And, and I think the way that he had that set car set up and the way that he drove, he can certainly make it work. Um, but you know, for, for most people, you're going to end up putting in a, um, you know, a, a clutch type limited slip diff. Um, so you've got, you know, a clutch pack that is, um, you know, effectively, uh, sandwiching or is sandwiched, um, by the, by the two, um, stub axles inside the the differential. And when there's a, a wheel speed difference, um, it causes the, um, a cam for lack of a better word, that's built into the center of the diff to cause those, uh, plates to expand and push harder on those clutches. And that works in both, um, for, for forward acceleration and I'll call it reverse acceleration. So, so acceleration and deceleration, and you don't want the same behavior 
from a lockup standpoint on acceleration as you do on deceleration, at least not for an autocross car. Um, because if you think about it, if, if you think about the extremes, right, like think about tuning a car um, and, and, you know, making a shock change or a tire pressure change, right, make a huge change one direction or the other and see what happens. If you have a completely open differential, right, the two sides are not coupled whatsoever, um, you always have equal torque at both stub axles. So if one tire becomes unloaded or less loaded than the other side, it will start to spin because it's still receiving that torque. Um, the opposite would be a spool, right? The two the two tires are locked together. You know, the the if whether you've welded the spider gears or whether it is just a, a fixed spool, like a cart. Um, in that case, the car won't want to turn at all, right? On acceleration or deceleration, unless you're spinning the tires, uh, because there's 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 nothing to allow a wheel speed difference between the left side and the right side. So you you kind of want that a little bit on acceleration, right? You want to be able to you know, put down as much power as possible. And that means you want to be able to deliver, um, you know, torque to the most loaded tire. Um, but on, on D cell, when you're entering a corner, if you have a spool, the car's just going to want to go in a straight line. So you need to find a way to tune the differential. So it'll be more open when you're decelerating and then it'll start to lock up when you accelerate. Um, and everyone kind of likes, you know, a, a little bit of a different setup. Um, I guess when I, when I bought the BMW, it had a it had a road race diff in it, which means that it was it was set up to be stable on corner entry, um, which means that it had a lot of lockup on decel. That's not great for autocross because again, the car doesn't want to turn. Um, so putting a better differential in it and, and and resetting those ramp angles so that the car was the diff was basically open on decel and then locked real tight on excel has made a huge difference in the in, in the stability and the and the turn in performance of that car. Is, that's probably because on the track you're never turning as much while decelerating as you are in autocross. Is that? Yeah, and I think and I think inherently, I mean, if I think about going to the track, um, I would probably not want an autocross setup, not a DSP autocross setup for a track car because the car would be too nervous. I mean, I think it would it would be too inclined to swap ends on on corner entry. So there would be certainly changes that I would want to make to a car to make it, you know less uh you know less likely to want to um to rotate on corner entry whereas you know one of the things that i focused a lot of energy on with the dsp car was how do i make the thing turn in as good as possible as effectively as possible so i can so i can get back to the gas as soon as possible so that's that's that and and making more power is (laughs) it's like 90 percent of what i've spent my time on with that car actually that's a lie 90 percent of the time has been fixing broken things but that's how do we prevent broken things on a DSP BMW? Um, carry spares is one. Um, you know, and and again, I you know, going back to that whole nut and bolt thing. I mean, a lot of the failures that I've had over the years have been entirely owner driver caused. Um, you know, I had a there. There's a variety of things that you can do to make the cars more reliable. There are, um, you know, I've broken axles. Every, everyone who's in a, had an SP car that does um, Pro Solo has broken axles. Well, there are stronger factory axles than the ones that come from the factory on a on a BMW 330. They are totally legal to run in street prepared, and uh, you know you can update and or backdate as this as this uh, was the case to something that's to a stronger axle. You can upgrade stub axles, um, and in fact now with the way they've written the um, the new uh, reliability r- mods uh, rules for for SP, um, you know, you can cryo harden things. You can select um, stronger components that don't provide you a like a weight loss or a performance benefit, but just make the car more reliable. So, you know, the the SPAC has really taken some steps to um, to make the cars more reliable in that sense. But you know, a lot of it is just nut and bolt. You know, you know, checking brake lines. You know, I, yeah, I've, I've seen people have brake lines fail at nationals because they were rubbing on these huge tires that we run, you know, make sure that those are, you know, in good shape, check your shock hoses. Um, you know, trailering a car is actually pretty, I've, I've had breakage on a trailer because of the, of the vibration of going down the road and it's, and it's, you know, you just have to get to an event and, and nut and bolt the car before you, before you take it out. I got a random thought here for the trailering. 
Do you think it'd be better if we are strapped down or the cars are strapped down by their tires versus how I'm always doing it? I'm strapping jack points or, or towing points down to the trailer, trying to hold the car down versus I've watched recently the cars on trailers where they have the netting over the tires and the suspension is doing its normal work. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I from a um, from a stability while towing standpoint, I really like I really like tying down to the, the frame, like you, like you said, or the BMWs have a great um, location that you can put a T hook um, where they're, you know where they're the jacking points, and it's very easy to tie the car down. And, and I and I really like to see the car not moving when it's on the trailer. Yeah, the you know the shocks are are compressed down a little bit. Um, but they're not. They're also not cycling as you're going down the road. Yep. Um, I really don't like the the strapping down to the wheel method because um, you know it's just it's it's putting strain on hubs and 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 shocks and, and things. And they're you know we're, most of us in, in SP are running shocks that are fairly expensive and you know need to be rebuilt pretty often. And so you know minimizing the just amount of bouncing time you know as you're going to and from events I think makes them more long lived. Good so, point. Yeah, I use the frame method. And, and the other thing I realized when we were strapping down the GT3 was the alignment had changed on some of his previous cars. And I was like, if I'm strapping to this wheel and cranking this car down, I'm putting a lot of strain on your alignment settings. So that that method, I did not like the idea of at all because I'm like, wow, if you want to change toe, we're really changing the toe for the whole ride out and back. Versus where I've seen those kind of over the tires – I guess that's not going to change. Hopefully it doesn't, it pulls straight down more so. But the method I was trying to use of going through the wheel was freaking me out that, wow, what alignment will we, will we end up with once we get there? Oh, yeah, yeah. Stuff stuff can slip, so. <laughs> See, like, that's one thing I love what David Whitener said. They will check their alignments once they get there and then check again the cars that won or that did really well to make sure the alignment is what they thought it was they didn't end up with some magical alignment that then they will get checked later on and change. So I, I, I think that's like going beyond, but once again, if you want to be at the pointy end of the stick and winning and competing, it's great to do that compared to me who's shown up with an inch and a quarter toe in trying to compete with Andy Hollis and a civic didn't go well. At least I realized that, but it's all these little things do add up if you're trying to be, be or compete with the best of the best. Oh yeah. I, I mean that, it's funny you bring that up because that's exactly what happened to me at, at nationals last year. Um, I, I towed out for the pro finale and, um, we, uh, the, the, the rear camber on the, on the BMW was adjusted with a, um, you know, adjustable length, uh, um, lower link. Uh, and it, as it turns out, it, it's, uh, if the jam nuts are not tight enough, um, that will vibrate as, you know, as you're going down the road. And, uh, I ended up with, um, about three and a half degrees of negative camber on my, my left rear wheel. And I ran the entire pro finale like that. And, uh, I didn't, I didn't realize it until later we were chasing this weird handling problem. And this is just, this is just me being stupid and not, and not looking at, it. but I, you know, I stood back and I was actually sitting in paddock, drinking a beer and kind of drawn, drowning my sorrows and, um, and looked at it and I went, huh, that didn't look like that when I left Maryland and, you know, got out the, uh, the, the level and started checking and went, Oh yeah, it's, you know, and when you add that much camber, you add a bunch of toe also. And so the car was, you know, had a, a quarter inch of toe in on one side and it had an extra degree of camber. And that's just not, that's not a recipe for going fast. So check your alignments. If you're out there listening, kids. Yeah. And, check- and, and realize he was able to look at it with a beer in his hand, probably sitting down going, that doesn't look right, right there. And, and nowadays, you can get a phone app for free that'll show you. I'm not sure how good it is, but with something straight against your will, it might give you enough to give you a clue if you're off by a degree at this point. Well, yeah, but I mean, look, you know, if a lot of us travel with toe plates, I mean, I, I if I had taken five minutes and checked with toe plates, I would have known that something was wrong before I started the pro finale. So I think the lesson to be learned is drink more beer because it makes you find things that are wrong with your car. I like it. I like it. And that's where being meticulous. For people like myself, that's not what I'm known for, but that's why I have lists. And, and at times, I've carried lists of, okay, what am I going to think about before each run? Like, I'm going to do these set of things even inside the car for a mental game I play with myself. So you all might need to make your own personalized list that you need to follow up on. And it may be things like, hey, once I get there, check these things. 
because I, I've not done that, and it's cost me for sure being competitive at all. Oh yeah, I, and and that's you know I I have a list that I that I carry with me of things that I check, and I believe me, I add things to it at, every time something goes wrong. I go, wow, I never I never thought that I would have that failure. I never thought that I would have that problem crop up. But the the fact of the matter is it, it, that you know they will crop up when you are furthest from home and the furthest away from your spare parts or the furthest away from the tool. And I'm convinced that this is how people end up with enclosed trailers because you eventually start amassing this list of, well, at this point, I really need to have a spare car that I tow with me. So I need to have an enclosed trailer and just have a disassembled 2002 BMW 330i that I have screwed to the sides of the trailer. <laughs> Be like, I can make it through a Pro Solo. So when did you first get into Pro Solo? Um, God, I can't even remember. The fir- I think the first one that I ran was... The 2000, I want to say it was the 2007 DC Pro Solo, and this was this was back. So I was driving the Boxster, and this was back when um, there's a guy. Um, I don't know if you know him, but jo- Jonathan Roberts, he was a East Coast guy. I think he's from North Carolina, um, but he was running a an STI, a Subaru STI in. Um, I think yeah, this was an A stock, and he was absolutely dominant and we just you know he and i just ran i want to say we ran two seasons um against one another and we had some absolutely incredible battles and i think that was what really sold me on pro solo and the fun and the and the focus that you have to have i think to be good at pro solo was was doing those events and running against jonathan for those two years were you hooked right off the bat the the add fuel to the fire absolutely absolutely i mean it was Pro solo to me is how autocross should always be. I mean, I, I you know, I think my biggest struggle um, is getting as fired up for for a tour style, you know, three run each day event as I do for a pro solo because pro solo is so rapid fire. You know, you just you almost have to. It kind of forces me to turn off my brain um, and just and just run and feel the car, and that is that's one of those mental things that I figured out over the year. I, I, you know, and Shelly Monfort and I have talked about this at great length. There's this, this thing that, um, uh, Sam calls engineer brain, um, where you get into this over analytical kind of going around the course and trying to be super precise and put the car exactly here. And, and you're slow when you do that, you have to turn everything off. And I don't know if it's get pissed off or get fired up or, or whatever it is, but find a way to turn off your brain and just go and attack the course and pro solo. That's absolutely automatic for me. Um, and, and I think that's why I'm, I find myself being way better at pro solo than I am at, at just regular autocross. That's interesting how you put that. I still wonder how I seem or why I am better at pro solo. And I wonder if it, it's a handicap for some people that they, they do drive analytically better than when their brains just turned off. Because I, I feel like I've always driven better with my brain turned off, whether it was I'm tired, slightly hung over way back when. I don't really do that much anymore. Have, maybe that's a, the key I should try. But it really is, hey, I get another run, and I've got a minute or two max between runs, and let's get excited and go. And something else you made me think of was the Whitener group down there, the Texas group, I should say, they will pick a word for each run or each day or each session at Pro Solo or something else. Some person might need to be pumped up and get angry, where somebody else might need to be calmed down. So depending on who you are and the event you're at and the run you're on, you might need to have a certain intent for that run to get the best out of yourself. Well, yeah, and I, you know, whether it's a word or something to, to cause you to either focus or defocus, you know, depending on your perspective, I guess. Um, wh- whatever it is that, that gets you into that mindset, you need to find a way to to get yourself into that mindset. And, you know, I, there are all sorts of kind of mental gymnastics I think that you can do to, to, you know, I talked about programming. I think that there are different mental things you can do to program yourself to, to get into that mindset. Um, and one of them is simply, you know, a lot of people will say they get nervous when they, when they go to nationals and they'll sit there and, you know, their palms are sweating and their heart is racing and they're, they're nervous. And, you know, someone once said to me, oh, I'll just pretend like it's a local event. You know, just think, oh, this is just any other event, right? I, if that works for somebody, more power to you. That does not work for me. I, you know, I cannot convince myself that Nationals is just another local event. 
So, you know, a few years ago, I, I came to the conclusion that I absolutely had to program myself to be able to perform when I'm nervous and when my palms are sweating and when I'm, you know, when my heart is racing and, and, and that kind of thing. And I, I've, I've found ways to do that over the years and it has helped me tremendously. And how much of that will you share with us of how you've handled the mental aspect of, okay, I am nervous. And to give you a little bit of story for everybody, I remember my wife and I went to some, it was like, nah, a spiritual retreat, a couple's retreat, exactly what it was. And they're like, oh, if you feel nervous, you should sit there and say, I feel nervous. I tried that at nationals and I swear it made me more of a basket case than I've ever been in my life. I'm thinking maybe this is something I admit with my wife if I'm feeling nervous or anxious or something, but I try, maybe I didn't try it enough, but I was sitting there going, okay, I feel nervous. I feel nervous rather than going, Hey, you know what? You know how to drive. Just do what you do. So I took the tack that did not work for me also. So what, what tips and thoughts do you have around that? So one thing that I started doing a few years ago was, um, actually it was, yeah, it was, uh, for the 2015 season. So two, yeah, two, two years ago, um, was, you know, in, at the end of 2014, I, I just sat back and kind of thought about nationals and, and, you know, I had some car breakage problems of course, and, and didn't do as well as I wanted to as a result of that. But, um, the, re the thing that really struck me was during the pro finale, I drove great. And I, and I wasn't, and I was, and I was nervous, but it was, it was, po it was a positive kind of nervous energy. You know, it was a, it was the feeling of, I can't wait to get on the course and I know exactly what I want to do. I can't wait to get out there and, and, you know, run to run. I was improving. Whereas at nationals, it was more anxious to the point that I wasn't sure I actually wanted to drive, if, if that makes sense. And I thought about about that a lot in the off season. Did, did some reading and talked to people. And one of the techniques that I tried was, um, I would go. This sounds ridiculous, but I would in the off season I would go sit in the car, and and I would put my hands on the steering wheel and my feet on the pedals, and I would close my eyes and I keep my head up and I would uh, run myself through, you know, a, the best run that I had ever had. You know, I think everyone has one of those runs, whether it's at a local or a pro or at a national event or something where they just, everything clicked, they were, they were on, they put the car where they wanted to be. And, you know, there's no such thing as a perfect autocross run, but as good as you've ever done. And you know that feeling. And if you're like me, that run will stick with you for maybe the rest of your life, years, certainly. And you can remember everything about that run. And so what I did was I, I sat in the car and I pretended that I was in grid at nationals. And I started the engine and I could smell the, you know, the E85. Again, I, I know this sounds ridiculous, but can smell what the inside of the car smells like, you know, it's, there's, there's Hoosiers in the garage. It smells like, you know, it smells like Hoosiers. I can place myself at nationals and I immediately start to get that nervous feeling. Right. And then I just ran myself through that best run that I've ever had over and over and over and over again. And I did this over the course of months to the point that every time I got in the car and I started feeling nervous, that run that it was, you know, or, or multiple runs that were just amazing kind of crept into my mind and, you know, you get to the point where you get to an event and you start to get nervous and it makes, for me at least, it made me fired up because I knew I was going to do the best run I had ever done. Um, and I think that kind of, that's what I mean by the mental programming. I mean, that's, it's certainly not going to work for everyone. It, it works for me. Um, it definitely helped me. And that was, and 2015 was the best year I'd ever had. I mean, that was my first, um, that was the first time I was leading nationals after, after a day and I ended up losing by... 17 thousands, which was a killer, but, um, but still, but you know, I was still tremendously happy. Yeah. So you're excited to have the mental breakthrough of even being that competitive. So, so overall, yes, when losing by 17 thousands or being, let's not say losing, you came in second place with 17 thousands. So you did the best you've done yet. And I, I don't think any of it's crazy to think, I think more people should try that. That's a mental visual visualization. Have you read any books that led you to that or what led you to that thought? No, actually, there was a um, there was a blog that um, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna give this to the wrong person. I think it was Neil Tosin wrote, um, and it was and it was you know it was an article that that came our blog that he that he wrote that was right before nationals, and uh, my co-driver at the time sent it to me, and um, and I read it and it just it just clicked with me and I went yeah I mean I I totally I totally get that because he was talking about the whole you know. 
uh, yeah, I can't convince myself that nationals is just any, is just any event. Um, and, uh, you know, some of it's that, and some of it is just realizing over the years that, um, and, and Sam Strano was a huge part of this. And I think it was him driving with Shelly, who also is an engineer and has that kind of engineer gets into that engineer brain thing of overthinking things, um, of finding ways to decouple your conscious brain of overthinking things and, and put you set, put yourself more in kind of the, you know, the ape brain of just reacting and, and going out and, and living things as they are. Um, and that is not an easy thing to do. And, I, and I'll tell you the, the, the first time that I actually had that happen was, um, the, uh, the New Jersey pro solo, I think the first one that I ran in the DSP car, this is like th- maybe three or four years ago. Um, I was, I was down, it was, it was Sunday morning. I had, I, uh, you know, I was, I think I was in second place in the beginning of that morning and I did one run on the left side and then I went over to the right side and they, and they did a manual. There was a problem on the course or there's a problem with the timer. So that pro solo, I know it's hard to believe, but, and they went into a manual start. And, uh, if you, if you pay attention to how they do manual starts, most starters will, um, will point to their right. So they'll, they'll, uh, be pointing to the person that's on the left side course and they'll wait for that person to give them the thumbs up. And then they'll point to the, the other course, uh, driver and they'll, and they'll wait for them to give them a thumbs up. And I saw we were doing a manual start. I was staged and I looked over and saw him point at the, at the other driver. I was on the right side. Um, and, uh, and he, and he looked back at, me and I was still setting my revs. And the next thing I knew the tree was coming down. I had never given him a a thumbs up. Um, and I had a terrible light, had a bad launch and ended up going slower on that side. And I came back absolutely furious. I mean, I don't, I don't think I'm known for having a temper, but I, I lost my mind. I was screaming, you know, I was so pissed off and my co-driver came over and he was like, dude, chill. What's like, what's going on? And I explained to him what happened. And he's like, don't worry about it. You're down by, you know, you're down by three tenths. Like you're fine. But when I went to the line for that next run, I was still fuming from, from what had happened. Um, and I did the, uh, an absolutely incredible run for me at least. Um, and, and took the lead and then carried over to the other side and took the lead even further and ended up with the win. And that was the first win that I had gotten in the DSP car. And I think it was, you know, not to say that you have to get mad or, or whatever, but, you know, find a way to decouple your conscious brain so that you're not thinking about what you're doing. Yeah. Interesting that the lizard brain comes up. There's a book. Well, the first one I think of when you were talking earlier was there's a book Josh Waitskin wrote. He was the chess prodigy and he had some good techniques. I thought in there that I've tried to apply and not just mental, but also bring yourself to calm back down. If you need to be calm what you're talking about isn't necessarily staying calm. You're probably more alert when you were a little agitated. But something I do periodically now is I try to sprint a quarter mile and see how quickly my heart rate will come back down and do it again. So it's just I'm trying anything and everything to expand my mental ability to be in the best zone. I like that you noticed, hey, I'm really ticked off. He said calm down. But something because of that had you tied in to doing better. And I've got to come back and also commend you on – the whole visual of going through the positive because this ties back into a piece that Josh Waitzkin has in that book where you want to get yourself in the positive mind frame about something as quickly as possible. So you got to yourself where you weren't, okay, I'm at nationals. Okay. I'm starting to get nervous. How quickly can you play that good story? And I believe they have a whole set of things you can do for all aspects of your life that will get you in that right mode that you'll be the most successful in. So if I can pull up some more of those, I'll, I'll definitely put a little footnote in the in the notes here. But I was wondering who taught you that, and I'll check and see if Neil Tofson, if he wrote that, I'll try to link that as well. So I, I don't think you're crazy for doing that. I think you're that that's something more of us should do and try because I think it may work for you and work for me, but not work for somebody else. But somebody else's suggestion from business or somewhere else may definitely work for them. Yeah, sure. And I, and again, you know, I think the I think the point here is um, you make a great point about chess. I mean, the the, the point is really find, find something, you know, if you're, if you have trouble, if you have trouble calming down, you know, look up and and read and find techniques for people that have the same kind of, um, the same kind of struggles that you do. You know, if you have trouble getting fired up, you know, like I think David and, um, 
David and Kim talked about having a word, you know, or, or bouncing in the car, or like putting, you know, hands out the sunroof or something like that to, um, you know, to get you fired up. If that's, if that's what it is, you know, then, tr then try that. But, you know, don't, it's, this is not, uh, you know, for a lot of us, this is primarily a mental game. You know, when you get, when you get your driving to a certain level, and I'm not saying mine is cause it's certainly not, but when you get to a certain level, you need to find something to make yourself perform at your best at, 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 you know, at the right times. And, um, I, I read a book years ago on, I like rock, I rock climb quite a bit. I read a, um, a book a few years ago about, um, uh, what they call lead head when you're, um, when you're on a lead rope, in other words, you're, you know, you're, you're bringing a rope up with you and you're anchoring in as you go up the wall. Um, at times you, you have the potential to take a, you know, a 20, 30, 40 foot fall, right? Something that could be dangerous, could be scary. And, um, I was, I was reading a, a book years and years ago and they talked about, um, you know, when you feel yourself getting into that, uh, situation where you're, you're truly scared or, in, or, you know, it could be autocross, could be anxious. It could be whatever. Um, just let your, you know, let yourself be scared, but retain control of the situation. You know, you have to, um, you know, focus on, focus on where you are, um, focus on, uh, um, you know, convincing yourself that, you know, you're safe, you're fine, you know, that kind of thing so that you can stay focused because the instant you get terrified, um, you panic, right? And that's when you, you know, when you're rock climbing, you over grip, you get tired, you fall, um, you get sloppy with your footwork, you fall, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I think that fear is that lizard brain. And I have caught myself mid run realizing I am just clinching the steering wheel like no other, which I don't even think it's good for steering. You need to be somewhat relaxed and loose. So things like that, that's even the brake pedal you'd mentioned coming. I find myself not necessarily concentrating on it at big events, but every once I'll notice, wow, you came off of that really smooth. And now I'm realizing from what you've said, the weight transfer was really good there. Oh, yeah, you came off the brake pedal smooth. Right. Those things I think you have to get in that right state that you're not freaked out. You're not in the lizard brain where you can't pay attention. As John Ames said, I'm still blown away. That's why I want to call him Yoda. He goes in this class, advanced driving school. He's like, you should be evaluating how your car is moving across the pavement, as in kind of bring yourself back and just say, what are you doing? What are you feeling? And that's what the hands, the feet, everything. Can you abstract yourself just to be noticing what's going on because you, you know how to drive a car already? Can you now just take note of what you're doing? Well, absolutely. And, and, not, and, and I'll add to that, not just – what, you know, what are you doing or what is the car doing, but what's happening on the course, you know, what's happening to the racing line? Like what, you know, there, um, Andy talked about this in his podcast about walking the course, uh, before the challenge runs. And I, I, it's funny because I do the same thing when I'm lucky enough to make it into a challenge. Um, and it's, it's for the exact same reason, you know, that the course has changed. Um, so get, you know, get as much information as you can, out of the course. Um, one of the things that Sam has, has taught me over the years, and he is absolutely phenomenal at this is when, when, when we're walking the course after we've done kind of our, our scouting walks and that kind of thing, he'll start pointing out little details about the course that I would not have even noticed. Um, but if you don't have a, a person like Sam to help you point those things out and you're maybe not, you know, you can easily become overwhelmed by trying to look for surface irregularities or bumps or off camber on camber, that kind of thing. Um, especially at pro solo, if you've got data or if you've got video, um, you know, think about your runs after you've come back, go look at your data, go look at your video and try and tie together what could be happening. There was a, um, there was a, 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 a place in Lincoln that we run for the pro solo finale. That is, um, we run the same area on the, on, on each course, um, every year because the course always takes kind of the same path. Um, there's a huge bump on the corn side course as you're um, as you're turning back and heading kind of toward the the entrance to the uh, uh, to the to Lincoln Air Park, and uh, I think for two years um, I couldn't figure out why I always had a push in that corner. You know why I always kind of had a push or the car got loose or something. You know the car lost traction there, and I, and I mentioned it to Sam just at dinner one time, and he went, "Well, yeah, there's a huge bump there," but and he went on to a different topic, and I said, "Wait, what?" And he said, well, there's a, he said, there's like a two inch step in the, in the concrete or an inch step in the concrete that they, they blended with some, with some quick asphalt. Um, 
but you know, it still is a, you know, it causes the suspension to, to jack down as you go over it. And so, you know, you need to plan for that. And I kind of sat back and I went, you know, that, that was something that I could have noticed years ago if I had really been paying attention to what was going on. Um, and I could have corrected for it. You know, you turn in a little bit sooner or maybe you want to square up before you go over that, or maybe you want to get all your turning done before you go over that, that bump so that you have a better run down the, you know, what's always a straightaway after there. Um, you know, so being conscious of those kind of things and being strategic about your course walks is, you know, is something that I think everyone can do better. I, I want to tie that in to after we're done with the run, because I know those couple spots on the corn side or West side pro solo there, even the second turn that usually heads you back, I guess, North, there's usually a lip right there, but the one you're talking about, I've had my car bouncing off line there on some runs and not others. And I guess I'm not the guy that plans exactly where the car is at. I'm more looking ahead for lack of better words of where I'm going and how tight to the cones I want to be. But you're pointing out things that yes, in certain cases for a better run, you better have a clue that that's there and you better try to take the the line that's going to avoid that, or I'm glad you pointed out, maybe you go across it at a different angle because you got your turn done on the right side versus left side a lot sooner because of that. And I'm wondering how much of this we should be remembering as we finish a run going, hey, talking to whoever's doing your tire pressures or something, or hey, mentally, that was really bouncy there. Was it that way last time? What can I try to do different? Or can, as I'm driving and or walking course, notice that? Like look for it and say, hey, what am I doing? I'm a nutty person that notices when the cones are twisted or out of the box partially. So I should be able to notice those things as well, but I have never thought to necessarily notice the bumps like that. But you pointed out something that's, yeah, so often those courses there, it happens on that west side course. Yeah, and there's there's one on the other side, um, not in the same location. You know, they have they have um, some of those pavement steps, but the the one that's on the on the left side of the plain side pro solo course. Um, there, there's two of them that I can think of right now, and you're generally going in a straight line over them. Um, but, in, you know, and it, it becomes kind of a don't care, right? You know, if you're going in a straight line, yeah, the car gets, you, you hit a bump, but you're not turning, so it's it's not a big deal. Um, you know, but on the corn side, it's a, it's a, it's a really, really big, big lip. And um, yeah, it just, you know, a lot of people take video and they look at, and they look at data, but they don't, and I'm guilty of this as well. They don't necessarily try and interpret that. They'll look at, well, I was faster on this run versus this run. Okay, well, why were you faster? You know, did you spend less time in that corner? Um, can you see anything on the video? Can you think of anything from the from that run? And um, I think that's a big thing that has helped me over the years is actually coming back from the run. And, you know, you want to get out of the car and check tire pressures and change the numbers and all that kind of stuff. But in the pro solo line, you, you've got a little bit of time to kind of sit back and go, all right, let me let me sit back and think about that run what did I do well? What was different? You know, what did I, what did I feel? You know, was the time faster or slower? Um, you know, what can I take away from that? And can I apply any of that to the side that I'm on right now? Um, and if not, if, if so great, if not, you know, can I apply it when I go back to, over to that other side or when I come back from my next session? Um, you need to, you need to think about those things when they're fresh. Um, it, it's sort of like when you have a dream, it's very vivid right when you wake up, but 10 minutes later, it's probably gone. The same thing will happen with a, with a, with a run, whether it's good or bad, the information that you get, if you don't consciously, you know, think about it and cement it in your brain, it'll go away. Now, great points. And I want to get back more into that, even at the three run, four run, five run format of I, when back in the integrity days, I'd come back automatically roll the windows up. No, no manual auto and sit there and not talk to anybody and go, okay, what the heck did I do? Because now I find I find myself – I'm like, did you focus through that run? Because do you remember what the heck happened? And when I have somebody riding with me, I'll be like, oh, so what did you notice in that run? Or where did I mess up? And sometimes because I'm out of the practice, simply making it something I always do, I will forget the first 20% of the run and go, oh, yeah, I did have a big slide there. You're right. That could be corrected because I think that's so key to have a few takeaways every time. And as you pointed out for Pro Solo, I often think, especially in Lincoln – Okay, I'm going to the other side. What what kind of threw me off on that side? Because I know it's pretty much the same on this side. And I also think, is there anything different between these two courses I need to pay attention to over here from the previous run on the same side that I messed up on? So at the Pro Soul, I love that you're condensed in time, but definitely take that time to go through those runs right then and there. I'm now wondering, should I have a notepad to write them down? 
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, uh, that's, you know, it's usually, um, you know, for, for me at least, it's usually only a couple things that I really need to remember. And I, you know, they, 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 they stick with me, especially if it's something that, you know, is making you slower. Um, but you know, that, that also, you know, it's, it's helpful to have a spotter at pro solos as well. Um, you know, you can generally see a good portion of the course and have someone that knows, you know, that you, that you trust and that is, that is reasonably good, um, watch you and just say, because you may not make the right conclusion. You may not come to the, the right conclusion, you know, as being in the car as someone else who's outside and looking and seeing what the car is doing. You know, you might go through a slalom and say, Oh man, I absolutely nailed it. I was on top of every cone and your, and your spotter might come back and say, Hey, you got, you got behind, you know, I, I saw that you had to, you know, you had to feather the gas on the, on the exit of the slalom because you had gotten so late. Uh, and then you think back and go, Oh yeah, you're right. Um, and, and that gets back to the, you know, I've seen people get, um, at schools, um, really, really, really down on themselves when they come back and they're slower than their previous, than their previous run. And, um, and they will immediately, I can see they're mentally checking out and they're just discarding everything that just happened. And you have to say to them, no, 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 stop for a second because you did the first three quarters of that course. Excellent. It was just, you threw it away at the finish and that's what made the run slower. Um, and when you go through it with them, they usually go, oh, yeah, you're right. Actually, I did do that. You know, I did do that better. So, you know, being conscious of this kind of stuff and not, you know, you you don't want to retain bad data, but you don't want to throw away good data. And, and even the attitude, I look at all of this, even if I win, lose, draw, it's all more practice for the next time. So especially at a class, if you guys are taking classes or getting in seat time, do, don't judge the bad ones again. At least notice and try to correct it the next run. But every run, it's kind of like a round of golf. If you play golf very much, you'll hit a few great shots and go, wow, I can really do this. I can be great at this. Same thing on autocross. I guarantee you're doing something great every run, and there's probably a few things you can try to either repeat or do slightly better. Absolutely. Absolutely. Take us through your course walk mentality of what you're doing, how many pro versus nationals versus local. Um, well, you know, to be honest with you, I, I treat, I treat the local events as much like national events as I can. Um, I, uh, years ago I did not do that. Um, I would sort of treat the locals as just fun and, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't focus on the course walks. I'd be social and I'd talk to people and things. And I, and I realized that, um, I, I believe that that was, that was hurting my ability to, um, to focus, you know, the, the good, um, sports coaches, um, you know, always say something to the effect of, you know, you, you, you practice like you play and you play like you practice. Um, you know, if you, if you, if you don't put effort in while you're practicing, you're not going to put effort in when, when there's a game on the line. And, you know, I, for me that, that's certainly the case, you know, we talk about focus and I need to, you know, I've got, I've got a fair amount of attention deficit disorder. So it, it takes a lot of work for me to actually, you know, stay focused, um, you know, especially for local events. Um, but for, for as far as course walks go, um, you know, usually the first course walk is sort of just, you know, where's the, where's the course go? What's the general shape of it? You know, maybe I'm talking to people or, or whatever and, uh, and just kind of, kind of strolling around the course. Um, but, um, the second course walk is where I really start to say, okay, where do I want to start positioning the car for, for a particular element? Okay. There's a, you know, I'm, I'm going into a slalom that's, that's set up against me you know, coming out of the sweeper. So, you know, is it beneficial for me to try and give up speed at the exit of the sweeper to be able to hammer through the slalom? Where does the slalom exit to? Is it just another sweeper where I don't have anywhere to go? You know, do I want to cut distance? Um, you know, and then the third course walk is sort of, okay, what's going on with, uh, you know, surface irregularities? Um, we, you know, I run in, in DC and FedEx field is, you know, is like a, a 10 degree slope. Ah! <laughs> Sorry, and, uh, I've, I've run there once. <laughs> I know you, you love that. Um, it's you know it's like um, it's like Qualcomm. Um, you know it's 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 bumpy. Uh, it's not as it's not as cheese grater as uh, as Qualcomm because it's sealed asphalt. But um, you know it's bumpy and it's on a big slope, and so you have to you have to pay attention to what's on camber, what's off camber. Um, and uh, you know I, there there are a couple kind of things that you can running on a site like that that you get good at. at um, programming yourself for and I, I i hate to keep using the word programming but i really see it like that um there's a turn that we always do almost always every event at fedex um 
where you, you start to come down the hill and then you turn back up the hill. And if you think about that, that is a massively off camber corner. You know, people will talk about off camber corners in Lincoln and I just laugh because you, you know, you're, we're, ta- we're talking about like 10 degrees here. You're falling down the hill. And, um, and I'm, I'm walking with Sam once at a local event and, um, and I kind of stopped and, and walked off to the side of course and just looked at that corner. And he said, he said, he said, look, Chief, don't overthink this. Just aim at the exit cone. Just aim the, the, the BMW roundel that you got on the hood. Just aim that at the exit cone of this sweeper. And I said, well, you know, I just kind of looked at him. He's like, you're not going to hit it. I guarantee you're not going to hit it. This, this corner is 10 degrees off camber. But if you think about aiming the center of the car at that cone, when you start falling down the hill and you roll on, roll on the gas, you'll go right around it. And, and those kind of things, um, those kind of mental things start to, when you focus on a local event to that level, you'll start to focus that way at a national level and a national event. And it'll be, you know, exactly the same mental, um, approach. And I think that, I think that's important from a consistency standpoint. I've I've heard that thought of aiming at cones to miss them, especially off camber. And all of a sudden you said that I'm thinking about putting and golf. You, you aim to know that the ball's not going where you're going to hit it straight. It's going to curve around. The same principles applying for our cars. I even think about Mineral Wells last year, the Pro Solo, the left-hand side course. I told myself, wow, this is off camera. I should try to see if I can hit that cone. Because like Sam was telling you, you're not going to hit it. Because if, if you're driving normal, you're thinking, I've got this much grip, and there's no way you have that level of grip. And that's where, for those of you that can get out to do a Pro Solo or some events where you have more than three runs, you have six, seven, eight runs, these are things to experiment with of how, how close am I? How close can I get, especially on off camber to hitting that cone or putting a camera on the side of the car, doing the experiments of figuring out where you really are and what you're going to work on or what you need to improve on. Right. You know, and it, yeah, that's a, that's a great point. I mean, and, and if you, if you think about it, you know, even if you do in that situation, it's a flatter lot or something and you're aiming at a cone and you're going to hit it. Well, you've, you've got a gas pedal, right? Use, use the gas pedal and make the car push out to get around those, around those cones. I mean, if you're, um, if you're driving a course and you're driving around cones, you're going to be slow every time you, you have to, you have to be driving at cones and having the car move around them. So, so, and what I want to use the words to describe that is if you're on an arc, a slide arc or a big sweeper, and you're going to hit a cone, the best way not to hit it is not to turn the steering wheel. It's to add acceleration, which makes your line wider to avoid that cone, which is what John Ames had said, aim at them and accelerate around them. Just, yeah, and then you, and then you get to go faster as well. <laughs> yeah, so and that's where I think I, I've told myself and I tell everybody that I that listens when I was at the first pro solo and there was all those offsets and I adjusted my line by slowing down to be tighter. That was magical. It didn't matter that I happened to win the event. It was that I noticed that I was getting off line in a slight lift or slowing down, whichever, whatever it took to do that is what made that work. And that's the same thing. I think when people come off the brakes, if they start noticing, well, I came off really abruptly and, oh, now I came off smooth. You're going to feel that. And that's when you give yourself kudos, some reward, two beers, something. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. And and that's where I'm not so sure. Hopefully maybe if I watch some videos, I can come up with some of those mental runs I could go through while sitting in my car when it's not running I remember like the end results of things or it's funny how I, I don't have the memory to go through most full runs. Like even after the fact, I guess after the fact, once I've memorized a course and I walked it two or three times, but years from now or even six months ago, I, I remember parts of the pros of the national courses at this point. The second one mainly being for me, the West side corn side. I get that the really big sweepers, little tight thing after a sweeper, but it's funny. I think a lot of us, our brains work very differently and that's why listening to lots of people and trying different experiments or techniques and tips, something's a clue in for you that someone does, whereas three other people, you can't relate. Oh, sure. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, everyone's, everyone's brain works differently. I remember walking a – I was walking a course um, kind of a few steps behind Mark Daddio a few years ago. It's probably four or five years ago. It was in Toledo. And um, – and I remember him kind of stopping on course and he would, I would see him close his eyes and he would kind of turn his body one way or the other. And I, I ended up overhearing him talking to someone in, in, in paddock about it. And he was actually, and Mark, if you're, if you're listening, 
um, and, and I'm wrong about this, I apologize, but this is how I remember it. You, you described, he, you know, he described to them, well, you know, I, I, I was thinking I wanted to have the car at this kind of angle around this cone, but now I'm thinking I want to have it at this angle. And I, for a little while, I tried to drive courses like that where I said, I'm going to put the car exactly here and at this angle and you know back and at that did not work at all for me because you get back to that engineer brain and overthinking things and I was slow as dirt at the events when I tried to do that and I think the reason was it was the same it's the same reason that I don't walk courses even at nationals I don't walk courses more than you know three four five times at the most um, I don't think about where I'm going to break I don't think about I don't you know think about where I'm going to get on the gas because what happens for me is I will program myself and I will do that at every run, whether it's right or wrong. You know, I will, I will say, if I'm, oh, I need to break here, this section looks really slow. Well, I will break there on every run, whether I need to or not. And most of the time in a DSP car, you really shouldn't be breaking. So, you know, I, you know, I, you know, buyer beware, I guess, you know, I, I can't do that whole, I want the car exactly here. I want to break here, all that kind of thing. I, I really need to go out and feel, um, you know what the what the car is doing and adapt to it. And so for me, fewer course walks is generally better. I need to learn the course. I need to learn kind of a basic strategy, and then I need to learn what the what the surface is like. And then you know that's when having a really good co-driver or um, you know or data or video can can have you refine and correct things that you're doing wrong. I am your disciple. I have tried that. I'm going to break here, and I would break there. So maybe we should walk the course. I'm going to win here. I'm going to win here. <laughs> <'Cause>... <laughs> I've also tried the from David Falf. Okay, I'm gonna close my eyes and go through the whole course. That doesn't necessarily hurt me as long as I don't have those pre-programmed things in there. But I don't. I guess I kind of do that, but I do it in chunks now. I don't even necessarily close my eyes. I actually like to look out on course or say, okay, the cone's off to my left. I kind of see it over there. This next cone's to the right. I care about. It's got a lay down or two. So I guess I do some of the visual there. Um, I do want to circle back to something you said that was so good about spotters. Having somebody outside of the car, let's say at a pro solo especially, I'm thinking about Lincoln, you can see both cars as they go out. They can tell you you were ahead or you were behind when you got to that turnout or that turnout. I think that can be very valuable. Hey, you were ahead and then you blew that because by the next turn you were behind and you were ahead before. So spotters are the real-time video or real-time data you may not have time to look at, especially at a pro solo between runs. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Huge, huge help, I think. Yeah, so thanks for saying that so I didn't follow up quicker. So course walks, I agree. I'm pretty much in the boat with you about not – for me, I could overwalk, and I take it as I then have it so memorized, I'm not even really looking where I'm at or taking in. I'm just assuming, hey, I know what's going on here. Can you take us through the coaching experiences you've had with people, what what do you tell people? What are some of the beginners to intermediate to advanced people you've coached or worked with? What advice do you give them? Oh well, um, so I don't I don't consider myself a particularly great teacher, but I think I'm I think I'm good at one thing. I think I am good at is is um, pointing out things that people do that uh, you, know, you know mistakes that they're making and, and and convincing them to try different techniques, even if they think that they're they're wrong. Um, there was a, we had a, uh, an Evo school, um, that I taught with, uh, with junior and, um, and Sam and actually Julian Garfield. This was, I think two years ago down in Virginia beach. Um, and, uh, one of the, one of the students that we had was in an STI and it, this was typical Evo school. You know, you, you, you'd start, you know, kind of 90 degree corner, um, you know, a slalom into a, into a skid pad where you went, you know, almost 360 degrees around the skid pad into a, you know, a series of offsets or sweepers. And, um, you know, this, this STI guy, um, STI driver guy, uh, you know, we talked through the course. I said, okay. Um, I, I took him on a couple runs and then it was his turn to hop in the car. And, and the first thing he did was he, he went super, super, super wide into that, into that skid pad. And I, I don't know if you, if you've taken the, the Evo phase one, um, you know, the, the, the lesson is stay as tight as you can to that, that sweeper. And it's really a, you know, an exercise to teach you, uh, again, I hate the term looking ahead, but, um, to, to look, you know, through the corner, um, and to, and to st manage steady state throttle and, and keep the, um, you know, keep the wheel kind of locked and, and, you know, manage the push or the oversteer with your, with your throttle, find the exit, get on the gas, all that kind of stuff. He would enter super wide on every run that, um, you know, and, uh, we came back to the, 
you know, to the area where we're, where we get to kind of talk to him for a minute in the paddock. And I said, let me ask you something. Why do you, why do you keep going really, really wide into that sweeper? And he went, Oh, that's, that's, that's always faster in this car. You know, I've, I've, he's, he'd done maybe two or three years with events. He said, I'm always faster when I enter corners like that. But you know, it's just, it's the nature of the beast with the STI. And I said, all right, do me a favor on the next run. Try doing it as tight as you can. Just, just, you know, stand the car on its nose. Don't try and don't try and break as late as you can. Just, just, you know, break hard, turn in, and just stay as tight as you can to those cones. And you can do whatever else you want on the rest of the run. Just do that one thing. I don't care how you do the rest of the run, and let's see what happens. And you know, he did that, and he came back, and he he dropped, you know, three quarters of a second on a on a forty second course, and um, and he said. He said, I, I don't know why that was faster. He said, I don't know why that run was faster. And I said, well, you know, you did everything else about the same as you did that run. The only thing you did differently was you weren't trying to pitch the car into the corner or do something real crazy. It was just, you know, get the car hauled down, run a tight line, get on the gas and go. Um, and it was it was sort of a, you know, he had a mental, you know, he had a belief. And, and, it, and it wasn't just me. It was, you know, the two instructors that worked with him throughout the day. Um, managed to kind of get that programming out of him, um, and you know, just things like that. Just observing what, just observing what people are doing, and trying to get them to try different things, even if it's contrary to what they believe. And and I think even, um, you know, even drivers that are pretty successful need to every once in a while just try things differently than the way they've been doing them. You know, if you have one, uh, you know, visual way of attacking a slalom, you know, the the the, the visual trick that I or trick, not a trick, but the way that I t- tend to focus on doing slaloms is, um, you know, whatever element I'm, I'm exiting be- before that slalom that immediately precedes that slalom, you know, I try to find the number one and number two cones of that slalom to, to um, understand what the spacing is of that slalom, right, and make myself uh, conscious of the fact that, hey, this is a slalom. You need to slalom the first cone, right, so that you can stay ahead throughout it. And then as soon as I find that gap and I turn in, I look to the last cone in the slalom. And I just look at that one until I'm, you know, at two cones away from the finish of that slalom. Um, I know a lot of people that like the point to point, you know, looking from one cone to the next, um, you know, but that doesn't, I found that that doesn't work for me because then I start looking at the last cone in the slalom and that one almost never matters. So, um, you know, that's, that's, those are a couple of things I've learned, I guess, over the years. No, Nate, it it sounds like you're good at, and obviously seeing what they're doing and giving them something different. And I think so many of us can learn by watching other people, especially if you know they're fast. What line do they take through that element? Did it look different than the other people? And just notice those things for experiments. And I love, i got to come back to their belief, their bad pro- or their current programming, their assumptions. I have realized to get better in business and life and everything, you've got to challenge your assumptions when it comes to racing. Oh, I'm good at this or I'm good at that or I did this the best I can do. I found that's where riding with other people or having co-drivers and riding with them can really help you figure out what they might try differently if you're not good at making yourself try something different to try a new experiment. But really is all this comes down to challenging your assumptions and trying something different, especially if you're not as fast as other people are or anywhere close to that. I would bet you money there are some big mistakes or things like you just described where oh, I got to enter this wide because STIs have to do that, that, that are false. And it's really costing you a lot of time. Yeah. You know, um, obviously, um, you know, like, like the whitener said, you know, seat time, seat time, seat time, seat time, but seat time with, uh, they were not just doing seat time for the sake of, you know, repeating the same thing over and over again. They were working with, with, you know, people that were helping them under, at least at first, um, you know, get the bad habits out, um, and, and start training themselves to always do the right, you know, the correct things in the car. And that's the kind of seat time that you want is, you know, seat time doing what you're supposed to be doing as opposed to seat time where you just make the same mistakes over and over again. You know, I know, um, there, you know, locally we have these, uh, we have test and tune days and I know people that, um, I know people that are very successful that go out and do lots and lots of test and tune runs. I know people that go to nationals and do lots and lots of test and tune runs. Um, but if, you, if you're doing that and it's a positive, you're working toward positive, working on positive things, the correct things, um, then great. 
if you're just spending your time burning up tires and making this, you know, over overcooking sweepers or under, you know, way under driving sweepers and, and hitting cones all over the course, um, I'm not sure those are behaviors that you want to um, that you want to reinforce. So that that speaks a lot to getting someone who's better than you um, or at least different than you um, to to you know to drive with to learn from. Oh, I totally agree, and that's where maybe you don't have someone around you that you've done this with. But tell us what your thoughts are. I could see people sharing video and data with other people for the same course, sometimes not even on the same course, just looking at somebody else's video to have people point out, hey, what could I try different in this? What What's your experience looking at video and data? How much have you done that? If so, when did you start? What are you using to do it? Um, you know, tons. Um, t- I've, I've, got, I've done that a lot. Um, data... Um, <sighs> You know, I, I, I've gone back and forth over the years. You know, I, when uh, we ran the RX-8, we had a DL-1, um, you know, real, I, I would I would consider a precise instrument, you know, from from uh, G-forces G and from GPS standpoint. Um, and and now, um, honestly, what I what I use is um, I just use Solo Storm with a you know with a with a cell phone um, and a good and a good external GPS unit. And I know that there's there are a lot of people that. Um, you know, Steve Holscher, um, who's very likely not listening to this, people say, ah, solar storm, that's junk. Um, but honestly, um, from a precision instrument standpoint, yes, it's not a precision instrument, but from a, um, a segment time standpoint, um, very simple, quick analysis, um, you know, comparing one driver to the next or from one run to the next, or even one driver in one car to another driver in another car. Um, tremendously valuable, um, especially when coupled with video. And I'll, you know, at every pro solo that I um, run over the course of a year, um, you know, a bunch of us go out to dinner together. We bring our laptops or our tablets. Um, you know, we we look at, we you know, we upload and download uh, runs, and we start looking at other people's video, and we always learn something. You know, I, I look at Shelly runs with me a lot. I always look at her videos. Um, she does things often much, much, much better than, than I do in the car. There are things that I do better than her in the car, but the fact is that, you know, if we can piece together the things that each of us are doing right, whether it's through data or through video, um, or both, um, we're both getting faster. And that's the, you know, that's the whole idea with, with, with being a team is I don't care if she beats me. I have no, I have no pride whatsoever. If, uh, if I get my ass kicked by Shelly edits or anyone else, I'm fine with that. I want to learn how to get as fast as I can get. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, specifically as things we do, we spend a lot of time looking at, um, segment times. Um, you know, you, you pick a segment on the solo storm and, uh, and, and, you know, who got through that section fastest, um, keeping in mind that you can get through one section fast and it can slow you down for the next one. Right. So, you know, you have to keep those things in mind. Um, I'm not, a, I'm not a, I'm not a data analyst like, you know, like, like the whiteners or like Andy is, but, um, real high level kind of stuff. Am I, you know, am I, am I doing things right? Or are there, are there areas where I'm under driving or over driving the car, that kind of thing? Yeah. What I like, it's so quick to get it down and dirty. Hey, look at this line choice versus that one. I came from a track mate, which I think is much closer to the DL one, or at least it seems pretty precise for all the different things it could tell you. And this was now years ago for me using their firmware now that's yeah, probably five, six years old, but it was just invaluable to at least see for so some of us, we need to see that before it really sinks in that, oh, that line was a heck of a lot tighter. Or look at the speed you carried there versus my brake, lift, brake, gas combination there instead of one good brake. So I, I definitely think people should check out data. You can compare to yourself, but if you have somebody that can beat you, great. I like what you said, comparing at events. I've been, I remember in Packwood specifically, looking at video and showing it to competitors Saturday night before Sunday. They seemed amazed, and yet part of me wishes we were all in our own spec classes with 4, 5, 10, 20 other people where we could all compare and really see how we add up. Like, what can I learn from you? Can you still beat me tomorrow? That, that's how I feel about this. I, I don't know enough of setup to tell you that mine's better than yours or that I'm a, a god at any of that stuff, but I love the idea of if I can teach you this and you can beat me, I know there's more for me to learn and to accomplish. Oh yeah, yeah, I, I I totally agree, and I mean, I guess that's I'm not, you know, I'm certainly not um, a professional, you know, builder. I'm not the best um, setup guy or anything, but that's that's exactly why my 
um, you know, I took my whole DSP kind of lessons learned and I posted it online. Um, it was a year ago or a couple of years ago. And, and the, you know, the philosophy that I had, I guess, was, you know, if it makes more people build a car for the class, having, you know, a recipe, even if it's not a perfect recipe, you know, it's, it's worked for me, but even if it's not perfect, um, I would much rather have someone else, you know, added to the class. And if they beat me, that just means that I need to drive better or there are things that I need to learn. There's more, there's more speed out there. Um, you know, I'm competitive, but that's, you know, the winning honestly doesn't, doesn't, you know, is not the number one thing I'm going, I want to be as fast as I can be. Right. Does that, does that make sense? Oh, exactly. And what, what I think happens here is if you share information with somebody, they can be experimenting and tweaking while you're experimenting and tweaking, and then you can compare that. And that's what I really got out of the Texas group down there with the whiteners is they are sharing and comparing and tweaking and trying, and they don't just have one car they're doing this on. They're doing it on two or three Civics at a time, or maybe now it's two or three Miatas at a time. That That's where you can get the exponential or a quicker way to a faster result is how I look at that when you're collaborating with people. Yeah, and I guess one more, yeah, that's a that's that's very true. I mean, I, it makes me think about, you know, who, who else can I – you know, who else can I get in terms of, uh, you know, similar cars that, that wants to share data. But I, one thing that I just remembered that uh, I learned last year at an event looking at data was um, how much of an effect uh, having the car uh, have too much slip angle on, on corner exit um, affects acceleration, at least in something that's kind of underpowered like a, like a DSP car. Um, I looked from one run to the next on a, I think it was in Wilmington. And one of the runs I had a, what felt like a, you know, an okay slide, you know, it didn't seem, it wasn't lurid, but you know, it was, the car had definitely stepped out and the run felt fast. The time was slower. And I went back later and looked at the data and I can see the acceleration curves and the, the run where the car was at a, you know, seven or eight degree slip angle, it was accelerating much more slowly than when it was accelerate, you know, when I was at a, a two or three degree slip angle exiting the same corner, you know, even overlaying at the same speed, you know, the same starting speed. So, you know, little little things like that, you would never even think, you know, oh, that slide wasn't that bad. That didn't cost me any time. Well, in a in a car that's relatively low powered, yeah, it can be a, especially in huge tires. Um, there's a lot of scrub when you're when you're, you know, sliding something like that. Oh, good point. Oh, that just reminds me. The second time I thought of this while you're talking, Sam Strano. This was back in the F stock days, I think. Nationals had some big. It was like a circle with a cone on the inside, then the outside, then the inside, then the outside, or something. I remember watching him come out of the second half of that and leave just faint black marks the whole way. Like, and in my mind, that's what you're just talking about having a bit of slip angle from acceleration, but in some cars you can have too much and it's costing you. And I can't second that enough that it, I, from a front wheel drive perspective or from I'm pushing into a turn, you've over, you're giving it too much steering. You didn't slow down enough. You're killing yourself there by two, three, four tenths, five tenths to a second per time is what that makes me think of, especially for the newer drivers or even myself, this last event, the back end kicked out for, I don't know, a second. I knew, I know that's a ton of time. Oh yeah. And it, you know, like you said, it's different from car to car. So, so having data, um, or you can even do it with video if you want a segment time video. Um, you can, you need to know what works for your car and what doesn't, you know, it may be, maybe getting a little bit of wheel spin gets the car up on the cam and in the power band a little bit better. And so it actually is, is faster, but you know, the BMW is like a, is like a tractor engine, you know, it has very little, uh, top end pull, but it's got decent, it's got decent mid range torque. So, um, you know, getting, getting all of that power to the ground and getting the car pointed in a straight line, um, is, uh, is the key. Yeah. Oh, and I like your thoughts. You, I'm going to move back into the, your thoughts of attacking course, you get into the slalom and look for the last slalom cone. You must peek up to it and then come back to focus on each cone and peek up to it. What do you see your eyes doing there? Um, so, you know, I, w I wish I could be consistent with it, but on the, on the runs where I'm fastest through a slalom, I'm not, I'm not peeking back at any of the cones at all because, um, and, and this gets back to a little bit about visualizing, uh, how I try and visualize course walk, uh, when I'm, or the course, you know, in between walks or after walks or, you know, when I'm going to bed or whatever, and I'm thinking about the course, but I really do look at the entry, you know, so imagine it's a five cone slalom. I look at the first two cones to kind of understand what the spacing is, attack that first cone and then immediately look for that last cone. And I don't look at any of the other ones, uh, throughout the run. And that's because you're, you're, if you're, if you're kind of focused on, um, 
I won't say fixated on, but you're focused on that last cone, you still have kind of a soft-eyed vision for all of the cones that are in your peripheral vision. And um, looking at that last cone and knowing on what side you're going to exit it, um, for me at least, that sets the rhythm of the slalom. And I don't, you still see all those other cones even though you're not looking at them, um, as opposed to looking point to point or trying to make my eyes go up, down, up, down, up, down. Um, it it, it kind of disrupts my uh, my rhythm and I start to get choppy. Um, so it really is you know, almost just focusing on that last cone. And then as you start to approach it, you're done with the slalom, right? So, you know, what's, the, what's the next element? Are you rolling on the gas? Are you trying to, are you about to get on the brakes? Um, mostly, you know, um, most slaloms seem like they, they, they exit with at least a little bit of a straightaway before you have the next, the next element. So, um, you're almost always accelerating out of them. No, very interesting. I, I, I hope to put that on the list of things to try. And it reminds me of Brian Peters at the test course at nationals, he kept saying, get your eyes out of the slalom, like get out to the next next bit. I think that was on like a four cone little tight slalom. I think he was saying, get your eyes out or get out of the slalom thinking, what are you doing afterwards? And I really believe what you're saying. If you're looking down a line of cones, trying to find that last one, you can't help but to see all the cones if you're even focused on the last one because you're going back and forth and they're in your line of vision. Because they're not much difference, especially if it's a very long slalom. So I, I could see where that would work, but it's something I've never thought of to even yep. attempt to find the last cone, honestly. Try it sometime. I mean, it even I think that what was the, the course at Nationals, the Cornside course this year, uh, Marcus's course had like a six or seven cone slalom. It was really long coming back at the feature turn. Um, and uh, that was a perfect example because the exit of the slalom um, – carried you into the next element almost exactly you know it's left right left right left right and then you had this big right you know big right turn um that you just wanted to tight 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 all the way through it um you know and if you if you didn't pop your eyes up out of that slalom before you exited it uh you know there was a there was a wall that was you were just gonna mow down and i saw so many people just uh understeer out of the slalom into that into that wall or into the marbles in front of that wall um and there was a tremendous amount of time to be lost for, for doing something like that. So, you know, try it sometime. It doesn't work for everybody, but, um, you know, even if you have a seven or eight cone slalom, you'll find you can pick out that last cone pretty easily and you'll see everything just line up. Uh, you don't have to look at each of those cones. Now, if we had a really offset slalom with a big or tight spacing somewhere, would you make note of that on the course walk and treat it any differently? Oh, certainly. Yeah, sure. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, absolutely. I imagine some places their slums are probably always set pretty equal, but I know we get kind of crazy. We'll have, and I, I admit this as a course designer slash setup guy, that sometimes the third or fourth cone will be tighter. So I will always key on that. Okay, I can't be behind for that. If anything, I'll slow down before that. So once again, as you said, I can accelerate out the slalom if there's a fast section or a straighter section after that. What are your thoughts on sweepers from what are you looking at? What are you thinking about corner entry versus exit, brake pedal, et cetera? Um, well, I guess I, you know, I think the thing that I'm probably worst at when it comes to, uh, to, to autocross is, uh, is, is getting, getting the car slowed down for in particular tight elements. And that's something that, you know, I've worked on for years, just, um, you know, trying to train myself that there's very little to be gained by, by, uh, breaking too late, you know, or at the last possible second for a, for a sweeper, but there is a tremendous amount to be lost. It's a, it's a very, uh, um, very high risk, very low reward, um, kind of, kind of maneuver. Right. So I've really tried to train myself to, um, to, to slow the car down early and just modulate, you know, the throttle. I'm not a left foot breaker for a variety of reasons, but just modulate the throttle through, um, through sweepers, um, while, while trying to not move the steering wheel at all. Um, I think it was, um, talking to Brian Heikauter the one year that he ran, um, DSP with us and won, um, he, uh, he, you know, he made a, he made a comment kind of offhandedly in, in, in grid. He just said, well, I just, I just try and turn the steering wheel as little as possible. And that really, uh, that really resonated with me thinking about, you know, the, the class I'm running in being kind of a momentum class. Anytime you turn the wheel, the car slows down. Right. Even if you're um, or, or, it, or it takes power away, um, you know, you have to give more power to get the car to maintain the same speed. So um, I think about that in sweepers, you know, just trying to keep the steering wheel in the same location and manage the attitude and the arc of the car, um, you know, purely with the throttle. Um, 
And, you know, the one thing I guess that I have learned over the years, um, I'm not sure who taught me this, but um, approaching a sweeper, um, you know, people, again, people say, look ahead. I like to, uh, Sam has always uh, said, just don't let yourself get surprised. It's not so much looking ahead. It's just don't ever let yourself get surprised by anything on course. And one of the ways to not be surprised is, um, you know, classic Evo school thing. You're coming up on a, on a sweeper that is defined by, you know, maybe one, two, three cones to set the arc. Just walk your eyes around those three cones. Um, and that instantly kind of programs your brain. Ah, I know the arc of this corner. Therefore, I kind of know instinctually the speed that I can take this corner at. Um, and, and that kind of gives you that visual um, uh, you know, that programs your that programs your speed and your steering wheel input and how you come off the brakes and things like that. I, I totally agree that I, I use the words, I, I quickly glance over or I cheat over with my eyes to know the arc. And after reading, oh, I got to remember the name of this book, I try to draw sometimes, especially walking course, I try to color code even the line I try to take through here from heartbreaking, blending inputs, arcing, Sometimes when I'm driving, I can kind of do that and be like, oh, here's a line that goes through this. And I think you only get that by what you're saying. Look at each of the cones that defines it and make an arc that goes through there. And that's where I've learned by watching people. If you see me standing on course, walking course, and I'm kind of curving my arm around, I'm trying to paint a line or draw a line and see which arc makes the most sense to get through this feature. Hoping that when I'm driving, I will do the same thing and make the adjustments, as you said, even ideally with my speed, with my gas and braking and lifting to get to that optimal arc that will get me through those elements. Right, right. Yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly it. And it's, and I think it's, you know, I think it's more, it's more looking through the corner than it is really finding the cones, but it's, it's like you said, it's finding the arc and you're really looking through the corner um, to try and make your eyes trace the arc that you want the car to trace is ultimately, um, you know, it's like any sport, you know, they, you're, you're trying to hit a baseball. Um, you know, you don't, you don't look at the outfield when you're swinging the bat, right? You want to, you want to follow the ball into the bat. It's the same thing with, um, with autocross, you know, you want to, where you look is where you're going to go. It's so true. I was trying to teach my kids to ski yesterday. I'm like, Oh, look over here. I was like, look way over here. This is where I want you to go. Can you put the weight on that foot and go that way? So even autocross, and that's where I think I'm so tied to telling people to look ahead because if you can't look ahead, you just are relying on, oh, yeah, the course goes left over here. And if you're getting lost a lot, it's probably because you are not, you don't know where to look and or you're not looking where you're about to go two seconds, three seconds, four seconds from now. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I, I hate to rail on the, on the term look ahead, but the, I got, I've gotten burned by looking ahead too far. Um and, 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 you know, not massively, but, but running over cones that are in, in my near field vision, because I'm, I'm trying so hard to get to that next element. And so, and so that's why I, I, you know, I just try to try to remind myself, don't get surprised, don't get surprised, don't get surprised, you know, like allow, allow yourself to find the flow of the course. And I'm glad you brought up skiing because, um, this is something that my dad taught me when I was really, really young, and it has stuck with me. You know, I've been skiing since I was two or three, and it's stuck with me ever since then. And that is when you're when you're skiing through the trees, do you look at the trees? No, you look at the gaps between the trees. And that's the same way that you that you know I kind of envision going through an autocross course, right? You just you you go where you look. You don't want to look at the trees. You don't want to run into the trees. Just look for the gaps, and you'll find the gaps. Very, very good. I, I not I try to stay out of the trees myself. I repeat to myself, where am I looking? Where am I looking? Where am I looking to try to make myself come to this word, you know, or phrase looking ahead. When I say I look ahead, I have found people when I'm telling them to do this, they look ahead and they never look back. So maybe I should be saying for some people to get this scan ahead. I scan ahead, but the only way I am such a nut that I notice and I yell and I point at cones that are not perfectly in the box I've scanned over there and I scan right back. I'm always looking or quite often I'm looking at the cone I'm approaching in between scanning ahead. And in doing so, I will make minute corrections or big ones if I think I'm going to hit that cone. So my looking ahead is for an instant, especially if it's far, far ahead. It's for a very short glance. So if I'm coming to a 180 
I will try to, even though sometimes it's very hard, turn my head, look out the window, see that cone, and come right back to where the heck I'm at and what is the next part I'm trying to master on this line through a turn or through a big sweeper. Do, I, I mean, hearing from you, I'm thinking you're looking ahead and staying fixated on that, kind of like looking through a sweeper, or you said look at the last cone in the slalom. You might look at the last cone in the sweeper and therefore miss the stuff in between at times. Yeah, at times I've had I've had problems with that, and um, I think the thing that has really helped me kind of get out of that um, that mindset has been, um, you know, you kind of program this on course walks, but there there are instances where um, you know you may be approaching an element um, that if you're looking if you're looking ahead, you may not see a path to get through that element, right? It may be um, you know, maybe a slot like years. Uh, I want to say it was maybe. Uh, 2010. There was a, I think it was Karen Babb did the um, did the the plain side course, and right near the finish, she had a slot. So you were coming through kind of a right hand sweeper, and you had to get through this this slot, and then the course curved back around to the left and finished kind of um, uh, you know going a, away from the planes. Um, and and if you were looking ahead, you would never you would never really find you couldn't find that slot until almost the last instant. But what you found was, as you swept around the corner and you started, if you knew what the, you know, where the course went, those cones sort of opened up as you went around that right hand sweeper, and you just saw the gap starting to open, 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 and it, and it's like a it's like a door opening, and you, and when you see the gap, you, you just you know you just mat the gas and you, and you shoot through it, right? That type of element is not, it's you know that strategy is not unique to that type of element. It's more. Um, you know, if you're keeping your head up and you're and you're like you said, scanning, you'll find those moments where the course starts to open up, and that will, if you if you know, you can train yourself to just go to the gas the instant you see things like that. Definitely, I find that it finishes, and actually at nationals on the west side course, we had that first big left into the right, that little two or three cone slalom. That to me was like a slot, and. I, as I looked over to that, looking over rather early, you can't see anything because it's two cones the wrong direction. But as you're saying, if you glance back at that when you're approaching it, at some point you realize, I'm on the right line, I can mat the gas, or oops, no, I can't. And what I can tell people, if there's something like that that's not easy to see, that's where I've memorized that first slalom cone or slot cone. I want to be really tight to the first part of it so I know I can be early, as you said, in a slalom for the rest of it. So some, because what you said, sometimes visually you can't see these slots or these tight gates. So I will key on, oh yeah, when I'm walking the course, I better sure as heck be next to this cone right here. Because otherwise this, or if it's a tricky thing, I know if I'm here, I'm safe. Otherwise, sometimes you just can't see it. You can't have pre-programmed coming up to it, or you can't visually catch that. You'll be behind unless you know, hey, no matter what, I better be here when I approach this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there. I, you know, I try not to. You know, a lot of people will. You know, they'll they'll you know, on places where you don't have a map, like nationals, they'll draw the course and things like that. And 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 I never really found that that helped me. But you know, whatever helps you to kind of memorize the things that you might get caught out by when you're running the course, like those little hidden elements, like where, like you said, you're staring at the butt of a pointer cone and you can't see anything else other than that until. You're on top of it. You need to kind of program yourself like, hey, I don't, I don't know what's coming, but I know that I need to be right side of the car, absolutely on the base of that one. Otherwise, I can't get through the next section. No kidding. You just pointed out something of mine that's a pet peeve. When I set up courses, and it's a 180 or some big sweeper, if I look across, I don't want to see the butt of that cone. I want those laydowns actually after that cone, so pointing further down the course, or they're further down the course than the actual cone is, because I. I if I'm setting up a course for somebody, I'm going to put extra laydowns on the important ones to see and to see way early, early as in two or three cones early. But like you're saying, that doesn't happen everywhere. So sometimes you have to go, oh, yeah, when I look over, I hope to see the butt of that cone, those two or three laydowns right there next to that cone. That's what I'm focused on to get out of the sweep or out, or out of this turn. Yeah, whatever, you know, whatever you can, whatever you can memorize, to, you know, to, to clue you in on what's coming. Yeah, very key. And that's where for any of you who have not done a pro solo, you're not going to have any chalk lines. You're going to have very few cones in general. And that's where I think they're usually higher speed courses, which I enjoy and I think it sets you up well for nationals. But just realize some of the things that we do locally, 
they don't apply at all when you get to pro solo courses. And I kind of like that. I even try to, can I do more of that and have less cones, less work, less cones to pick up for workers? Because at pro solo, it's amazing what they get away with, even worker-wise, how few there are there. Yeah, less less can be more when it comes to, to courses. Um, you know, I know that I've gone to some local events that have absolutely abysmal visuals, um, and it admittedly is a hard skill to learn. It takes it. I, I don't have it, but um, you know, it takes practice to be really good at setting up a course um, and having visuals uh, that help guide you through the course without just lining it with cones. Like we've had a few of those courses at nationals that are just. I think it was the first one, or, or it was a second second year only. It was probably 2010 in Lincoln, the the, cor- the corn side course, which is just absolutely lined with with cones, and it's it's. I find that to be such a distraction, and I think that's another reason I like pros is the kind of minimal, more minimalist approach to course design. You made me realize something. I only focus on the cones that are on the inside of courses, unless it's so tight that I might hit an outside cone. And yet, I remember a guy long ago here, fast guy. He was like, I can tell you every cone in the course if one's missing or something. And I started thinking, I was like, I don't even I, I don't even pay attention to any of the non-key cones or the other side of gates. If I'm ever over there and gonna hit it, oh well. I, it does it, it's no nothing I want to have any mental energy into. And that's where when setting up courses, we can make gates tight or open. And I suggest sometime running a really tight gated course because some of you like me will learn that, hey, you're driving too wide because you could. But just realize if there's lots of cones, I usually say if there's not a lay down next to it, it's probably not that important. So I'm really, I guess, mentally, I'm discarding most of a course or most of the cones on a course because they shouldn't matter to, I guess, my fast runs in case that would help anybody. Yeah, no, I think that's a, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I know people like that as well. They can, they, they you know, you know, they say, well, they, you know, the six cone, you know, the six cone gate or whatever, that's, you know, the wall wallums or whatever they are. And I kind of have to think about it and I say, well, oh, yeah, I'm not even thinking about those, you know, 90% of the cones on the course. That's what works for me. I have to discard most of that extraneous information or it just becomes noise to me. Yeah. So true. So true. So tell me, what's your wife think about this crazy addiction? I mean, hobby. <laughs> um, she, you know, she actually, uh, she actually enjoys coming out to events. Um, she likes uh, she she likes riding in the car. Um, I haven't I haven't been able to convince her to actually drive. Um, that's a that's a whole separate discussion. But um, she loves it. She loves going to the travel events. We we make kind of a vacation. That sounds ridiculous, but out of the Toledo Pro Solo every year, we take some time off of work. Uh, uh, there's a um, Cedar Point is like a massive uh, roller coaster you know amusement park uh, that's near there, and we we. Uh, used to go there when we were in college and so it kind of takes us back um you know we go out there and spend a day there and then and then go to the Toledo Pro and um she loves it I mean she loves um she's she's one of these people that I don't know if it's just my influence or whatever but she loves watching DSP she's just the cars are ridiculous and um you know they sound cool and it's it's fun to watch she loves coming out and watching uh SSR you know she has a she has a good time with it but uh uh, you know, haven't been able to convince her to uh, haven't been able to convince her to drive. What does she drive daily? She's got a uh, Mazda Speed Three. Oh, just let her, let her come out in that, or force her to drive that, not your car, just that. <laughs> no, you know what it is. She doesn't want to work. She says uh, she's like, if I could come out and I didn't have to work course, I would probably do it. I was like, I will work your your work assignment for you. You can come out. You don't even have to do it. I'll work two work assignments. She, and then she says, eh, no, I don't want to be bothered. I'm like, okay, fine. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna force her. You're not gonna force yourself to work an extra assignment. So this is this was news to me out in California. I'm not sure it's true for their event, but for their test days before their events, yes, I'm jealous of that. I'm trying to create that here. You can pay. I think it's a local SAE college guys. They will work your assignments for you. I don't know if it's ten bucks, twenty bucks, what it is. They basically use the money to help fund their program. I love it. I don't remember if I took advantage of that or not when I was there. But I love that idea. Think about it. Some people are out there would like to make some extra money. As long as the clubs will allow it, that could happen. And that may help some wives or even help people have time to fix their cars or tweak or do a test and tune by changing things because they're not working if your event's broken into two pieces. So I love that. If more of us can create that around the country, more power to the people that want to make a little money. That's a great suggestion. Yeah, I'm definitely going to take that back to the the D.C. region folks because we have a pretty – 
we have a pretty vivid, uh, um, active um, SAE team here. So uh, yeah, maybe if they're if they want to make some extra money, I would I would definitely be up for that. I I was like, wow, that's nice. That's really a nice option there. So what what's been your favorite car? Oh, the BMW, no question. So it's, um, you're keeping it for a while. Oh yeah, I mean until um, yeah, I'm I'm pretty convinced that the RX-8 is the is the car to have in DSP um, 90% of the time at this point. But um, it's having uh, having driven so many other cars in in solo um, and, and on the street. I just can't. I've never. I haven't found anything that is remotely as much entertainment as the uh, as the BMW is. Um, and, uh, yeah, I've, I've driven a lot of stuff. I drove Sam's, uh, Sam and I drove at the DC tour last year. I drove his, uh, C6 Z06 and that was an absolute riot. But, um, but the, the DSP car, there's just nothing that comes close as far as I'm concerned. Have you been in a CSP Miata? No. And you know, I, uh, I, I keep thinking that, uh, that I need to, cause I hear that, um, I hear that those are an absolute riot as well. And, um, um, again, it's kind of the same it's kind of the same thing on a smaller scale. You know, it's like, it's, uh, you know, the DSP car is like 2,900 pounds. The CSP Miatas are probably, uh, 1900, you know, 2000 or somewhere, somewhere around there. Um, you know, I make two, two fifty five or so to the wheels and they make, I don't know, like one sixty to the wheels or something. So it's like, you know, it's just everything kind of scaled down. Right. And with a suspension that actually works, they have to be a riot. How can they break things with that kind of horsepower? I don't get it. Uh, you know, I think it's uh, it's uh, small small components. You know, small axles that were never meant for for uh, for the the clutch drops that you have to do to spin the big spin the big Hoosiers. I think it's probably the, the shock loading is a big part of it. <laughs> all right, if you could build, all right, if you could drive anybody's car that's out there already, whose would it be? Oh God, this is this is the easiest question that you've asked so far. Beth Strelnick's three rotor SSM RX seven, no question. I like it. That should be more popular. A more popular answer. I remember in the streetcar magazine, whichever one back year, maybe a decade plus ago, they drove one of those cars with three rotor and said it was the fastest streetcar they'd ever driven. So that, I'm glad you're ballsy enough to do that. I would. Yeah, I'm a little scared. I, I should admit to have that much power because that that thing just rockets. Oh, it's. It, I mean, it sounds incredible, looks incredible, but the other uh, is certainly on the list is uh, is Kiesel's. Uh, Kiesel's bug eye, um, that, that thing, um, absolutely insane. Although I, I think I would be, I think I'd be embarrassed how much slower I would be than, than, uh, than Jeff driving that car. So I had, I'd have to take a pass on it. Well, it's okay. Just don't have any recording going on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No times. Right. <laughs> like there's no evidence of this. That's where Matthew Braun, I said, Hey, can I go for a ride? He forced me in his car. I'm like, I have so little experience in a car like this. I was more scared. I just spin it by pushing the gas pedal. Finally, he felt guilty and came back and took me for a ride. I was like, I, "No, I just want to ride. I don't. I don't need to know that I'm not fast. I have no clue how slow I was in that." But <laughs> same type thing. I, I would tell people if you get a chance to drive some different things for fun, a run or two, do it. It's always been eye opening to me. Although I've still been able to resist all the power generally. So now, if you can build any car, and if I have to, we may have to take the DSP BMW away. Oh, we got to take that away. Huh? I was gonna say I'd take that to street mod, but um. Oh, okay. That go with that thought. Yeah. No. Well, that's sort of the, that's sort of the long term plan. Is um, you know, I think I think DSP would. Um, I, I really think I love the, I love the balance of the car in DSP, but I think taking it to SM would be uh, would be a hoot. Um, if I honestly, if I was going to start over today and I was going to build a new car, um, I I think I'd buy an RX8 and I'd build it for uh, for street mod. Interesting. And you also said you think the RX8 would do well. In DSP, that's okay. So they have to keep the same engine there. If you go to Street Mod in the BMW or the RX8, what engine are you gonna put in those cars? The BMW, you, actually, the engine that's in it would be would be pretty good as a turbo engine. You know, just lower the compression a little bit, and that would be a and that would be a very good, very good turbo engine. It's not too hard to make a reliable, you know, 400 horse to the wheels in, in one of those, which is probably close to enough for for enough for SM. For for the RX8, um, yeah, I mean it would be it would be very very tempting to put a, a third gen uh, turbo uh, two rotor in that to so take the take the Renesis out of the RX8 and put in a, a turbo two rotor. Um, I just think with the 
you know, I know you can change all that stuff in, in street mod, but the, the basic starting platform of an RX eight with it being such a stiff platform and, and having such a, um, a suspension that works so well from the factory. Um, you know, the, the only thing that really kind of stinks about that car is the engine. Um, give it, give it more power and more tire. And, um, I think it'd be absolutely killer. That's neat. I'd never heard of or thought of that, but recently just hearing that it's a bigger Miata, that the suspension is so good and you second that, that's very interesting that it'd be a good platform to start with and you're going to want to either replace or redo an engine anyway. Absolutely. Yeah. Any people you want to note sponsorship wise or. Yeah. Sam has helped me a, a tremendous amount. Sam is a, is a valuable resource for, for tons of people in the solo community. I think that's why he's a, he's a, he's a driver of eminence. Um, he sells performance parts, he sells stock parts, and I, I try to buy as much as I can from him because what I found is is great about um, him, you know, Strano Parts as a business, is he will absolutely not sell you something that is not going to make you faster or is, that, or is the wrong part for your car. You know, there are a lot of places that, that um, you, know, you know, will advertise, uh, you know, whatever, whatever part, they'll sell you whatever, um, you know, even if it's junk and, um, and he's just one of those guys that he, he will not make money off of you selling something that's not going to work or something that he doesn't think is going to help you. So, you know, shout out to Sam definitely. And, and he's been a huge help with parts and, and advice over the years. And, um, you know, the other person that has helped me tremendous amount is, uh, Peter Florence, um, who runs PF tuning. He, uh, one of the biggest transformations that we made in the DSP car after I bought it was putting a real engine management system in it. And Peter convinced me to put a, a mega squirt in the car and um and, and that allowed us to convert from a um an electronic throttle back to a cable throttle and um that made the drivability of the car tremendously better than it was um with the with the stock engine management I and mean, he's he's worked tirelessly tirelessly with me over the years he he said he said to me once uh that, that i was a um a, a limitless, a boundless well of energy. Uh, and, uh, I think, you know, pretty much the same of him. He's put up with a lot of my, uh, um, I want to try this. I want to try this. I want to try this, you know, parts comparisons and headers and exhausts and intakes and cams and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, tr he's been a tremendous amount of help and he's, he's hardly charged me anything for it, but PF tuning, great business. He does, I know he does Motex and, uh, mega squirts and, and, uh, he may even dabble in some, uh, some GM stuff as well too. So, Shout out to Peter. Cool. I will link that there. I thank you for the time. Any other thoughts? No, this has been great. I really appreciate I really appreciate you you thinking of me to, to do one of these. Thanks for listening. For the show notes and contact information, please visit autocrosstalk.com. There you can also subscribe so that we can keep you up to date on new shows as they come out. Also, please leave us a review on iTunes and subscribe on iTunes for the upcoming shows. You can connect to our Facebook page at facebook.com slash autocrosstalk. You can share your thoughts, your insights, your questions, your suggestions there. Also, share with your friends. Hopefully, you found it entertaining and motivating, and hopefully other people will as well. It's been fun, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for listening, and check back next week for the next show.